So we are recording this uh, today for future viewing uh, opportunities for people who can't be there. And um, maybe you miss something you want to go back and, and view it later. So we will uh, definitely make that available after this um, is finished today. You will notice after each segment, we're trying something different. Instead of doing an overall evaluation at the end of the day, we're going to be doing one after each segment. So in the chat box, there will be a link to a poll that we're asking you to take. This is serving as our evaluation. So it's very important that you complete these poll questions. Uh, it'll be specific to um, obviously the topic at hand, but this is the information that we will give our funders. So please do fill those out. They're one question, maybe two or three questions, very short, but please fill those out. Um, also at any time, you would like to ask a question, uh, please unmute your microphones and feel free to ask a question or type in the chat box. Um, Eric, do you wanna talk about kind of the technology for today and um, how we'll monitor chats and things like that? Sure, you bet. So uh, again, thanks everybody for coming. I'm looking forward to uh, a, a good enriching day. Um, I, I imagine at this moment most of us have used zoom for one reason or another but uh, for uh, questions um, what we'll do is we'll put them in the chat function over there to the right um, so if you haven't uh, if you're looking at your screen today um, on the lower bottom is, is the chat it should then flare out to your right um, that's where we'll do questions I'll be monitoring questions um, and then when we get to that part of any one of the presentations, I will then go to you um, for your uh, uh, question. Um, at that point, then you can turn on your camera. Um, we would like all the cameras to be off except those who are speaking. Um, or uh, so for example, here in our student panel, they'll turn on their cameras here in a moment. We'll have just them up. It's less distracting to the speakers and then to us listening. Um, so we'll we'll definitely do that. Um, and then uh, again, just stay muted if you can, um, again, to provide the best experience for for everybody. Um, the, there will be a time after the student panel in which we will all uh, go into respective uh, breakout rooms um, or, or not strike that, not breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. You should have received on your agenda um, a uh, link. Um, to the respective uh, areas for the presentations on the mini grants. Those mini grants, for those of you uh, with Purdue, Earlham, Manchester, um, and wanting to, to see and participate in, that, in those mini grants will stay in this room um, after our break. Those of us who are with IU, DePaul, and Trine, um, those folks will come with me in a separate link. And I'll put that link in the chat uh, box here uh, a little later, but it also was sent out in the agenda. Um, and so we'll go in and have our kind of uh, mini grants this way um, so that everybody has a chance to present and get that information in since we're compacted all in all of our content today because of the uh, outstanding training that's occurring tomorrow. Um, so those are the ways in which those things will happen. So again, if we can all shut down our, uh, turn off our videos, um, that would be uh, most helpful and stay muted. Um, it will enhance the experience uh, best for all of us. Um, so Lisa, what else do you have Did yeah. I leave out? Thanks, Eric. I, Eric all I these surveys, yeah, you mentioned. Yeah. yeah, I mentioned those. And I also wanted to say that um, the PowerPoints from, all of the mini grant presentations will also be available. So if you choose to go in one and you kind of were interested in what's happening in the other group, you'll have access to that information as well. So don't worry about, you know, fear of missing out because you're not missing anything. Um, and then, um, you know, just like I said, feel free to ask a question at any point or make a comment. Eric will facilitate all of that for us so we're not all talking over each other, but I want this day to be as interactive as possible. I know we are all have Zoom fatigue. I feel it too. Um, 
but I do think we're still giving you the great information that you expect from our conference. And um, I will say a, a little bit about day two. If you decide that you do want to register after all for day two tomorrow with Peter Lake, which is all Title IX focused, that is fine. You can still do that. Just let um, Eric or I know and we'll make sure to get you on that list. Um, that day will be a little um, different than today because it's all, you know, one topic. There are no breakout rooms or anything. Um, but Peter Lake is an expert in Title IX. He's a lawyer. He's been doing this for years. If you are responsible for your Title IX report or you have no idea what the heck Title IX is, then it's probably a great opportunity for you. And I will have to say that having him for a whole day is a uh, pretty special he um we usually probably wouldn't have this opportunity but because we don't have to pay travel expenses and you know facility charges for our training uh this year we were we were able to get him also the great news is after tomorrow we are able to provide um some technical assistance to your campuses. If you need Peter to work with you some more individually, uh, we are able to um, offer that as well for a limited hour of technical assistance um, times, but we are also happy to be able to offer that because he is understands it like no one else and can really help you figure that out. Um, so I am really glad that you're all here. Um, I wish I could see all your faces in person, but we'll cross our fingers for next year. So welcome to the 2020 Indiana Collegiate Action Network Conference. And Eric, if you would like to uh, introduce your students and we will move right into the uh, student panel as they talk about how COVID has impacted their return to campus. Perfect, thanks Lisa. Um, so at this point, uh... Ahmed, uh, Mark, uh, Haley, and Jordan, if you want to go ahead and turn on your cameras and unmute yourself, that would be great. Excellent. Uh, see, I love it when technology works. These, uh, <laughs> these students, of course, uh, have been doing this uh, a lot more than we all have, so we need to just buck up and, and, and accept that <laughs> this is the way of the future. Um, anyway, so I appreciate y'all coming. Um, real quick, uh, Jordan uh, is joining us uh, from IUPUI. Um, Haley is joining us from DePaul. Mark is joining us from Earlham. And Ahmed is joining us from Earlham. So thank you all for uh, joining. Um, they both, the, all four of them, uh, I've had a chance to, to, to chat with. Um, and I think we're in for uh, you know a good, informative uh, opportunity today. And 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 to the to the students, um, be as forthright and as frank as you feel comfortable. Um, while you might have some representatives here from your university, they know and accept that we're only going to learn by um, what you all have to share, um, and that it's really meant to be productive and positive. Uh, for all of us, uh, so that we can continue to to meet the needs of, of the young people, or the students on our campuses. So, uh, with that caveat, um, what I'd like to just kind of do is start with a general question. And, and uh, Jordan, I'll start with you if you don't mind. Um, just briefly give us a sense of of what COVID, how has that impacted you, particularly on the mental health slash physical health side. We'll get into some other things around education later, but how's that just generally impacted you? Um, yeah, so it's been a year to say the least. Um, I have, I am like now in my senior year of college, so it has just completely taken over my life and I have had to have so many different experiences than I thought I ever would. But 
on more of like a personal level, like it has been really difficult, especially with like being distanced from my friends on campus. And I'm an out-of-state student as well. So not only am I distanced from my friends, I'm distanced from my family as well. So it's just been a really difficult time to try to figure out what are the best steps to take in order to protect myself and my family, but still give me that time to really focus on like my self-care and making sure that I'm okay mentally and physically. Um, so it's just been a little bit difficult. I have reached out to so many great um, partnerships on campus, as well as just reaching out to my friends and being like, okay, I know we're in this crazy world, but like, do you want to talk with me on the phone for like an hour, just so I can kind of get that social aspect of still being um, a student on campus. So it has been difficult, but I think finding those ways over these past, like, how many months have we been in this, like eight, of really just finding that peace, I guess, in COVID has been kind of difficult. But now that we're so far into this, I think I've really just tried to do whatever I could to get to a point where I feel like I'm somewhat okay with everything that's going sure. on. Sure. No, I, I totally get that. And we'll have a chance to delve a little bit more into some of those areas that you you alluded to. Um, how about you, Ahmed? Uh, also, uh, distance, uh, much like Jordan described, not, you know, being out of state, you're out of country. Um, so I know that that has its own challenges, but just kind of generally tell us about how you've been holding up mentally and physically during this time. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, I totally echo what Jordan has already said. Uh, I feel that being also out of country, uh, our international student here that also adds the stress of actually, you need to think about the breaks and what are you going to do over the winter break, what you're going to do over the summer as well. Uh, hopefully we don't have COVID by then, but that's also to actually like put into consideration. So all of these uh, extra added stress, a part of like, uh, like along with the academic stress and also the social distancing stress factor, all of it kind of piled together and you need just to make sure that you, you yourself are doing okay. Um, generally how I do it myself is that uh, I have my friends group bubble that I always hang out with and we always like, kind of test every week so that we make sure that everything is going fine. And that at the same time with, generally at Erlam, I think we're doing very great with the students so we don't have many cases and our communities really understand and they really appreciate that. That kind of gives a little bit more space for like in-person activities that also kind of align with the, with the social distancing guidelines. And that adds a little bit like to it and makes it a little bit like this risk to actually think about and have a little bit of social uh, interaction from one day to another. Uh, one stress that I absolutely, whenever I actually go outside to buy groceries from Walmart or any other place near Canvas, I like my stress level, my anxiety goes up and it's like really overwhelming because there's quite a lot of people and you cannot like actually control their interaction. Like you see the people not wearing masks, you see them actually wearing masks, but actually like half of their faces are already out. So all of this <laughs> understanding between uh, the community around you and um, the people who care and do not care, all of this makes also kind of contribute to to COVID, so yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and, and we'll go into some of that there. It's interesting. Yeah, we can only control ourselves. That is absolutely true. And um, I know that each of the, the colleges, universities put a lot of uh, protocol in place, but enforcement maybe, you know, uh, we all are doing the best we can, but we can't uh, be with everybody 24 um, seven. Mark, as a, Mark's uh, joining us from Earlham, is also a, a, an athlete on campus. He and I share baseball in common, which is fun. Um, but so help us understand, I mean, the mental aspect of it, like we've asked the others, but also the physical part and, and being disconnected from training and your team and, and things like that from time to time. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Chandro. Um, first, I just want to talk about how um, I've kind of taken advantage of COVID um, in an unfortunate situation. Um, COVID-19 canceled our baseball season last year, which was, you know, really the first time baseball has been taken out of my life. Uh, however, I went back home to Cincinnati and started my landscaping company. So I tried to make the most out of the situation. So for me, um, it, you know, it wasn't about being bogged down inside all the time. It was about trying to go out and make, you know, really make the best out of the opportunity. Um, so that's really helped me just from the mental side and the physical side. 
Um, obviously, the physical side, not being able to get in the gyms and doing what I normally do was definitely tough and challenging. Um, however, now being back on campus, uh, it's definitely different. Uh, coming from a team aspect, we can't bond together as a team like we normally did before. Um, and it's really hard to get like freshmen and, you know, the younger classmen involved. Uh, me being a senior, that was something that I felt uh, really brought me to this campus. And now we can't really do that with all the restrictions. Um, so, you know, like I said, I've been able to make the most out of the situation. However, I know it has been very challenging for um, a lot of other people. Awesome. Awesome. And, and I appreciate that. I've already seen a couple of themes emerge. Um, Haley, let's uh, have you kind of wrap up this first kind of general question. How are you doing mentally and, and through all of this and physically? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can definitely relate to Mark's answer a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just mentally, I feel like oddly, COVID has impacted me both positively and negatively. Um, in the positive sense, I've used a lot of this extra alone time um, just to reflect on myself and to try to identify ways that I can improve um, just on myself, on my life academically, uh, different ways that I can do better. And um, I think that just the extra alone time has helped me um, kind of just self-reflect and to look internally. And in that sense, I feel like um, weirdly, COVID-19 has imp impacted my mental health in a, in a positive way. Um, and then, of course, negatively, I've experienced a lot of what other students are experiencing. Um, I'm at home for the semester, so obviously COVID has through, thrown a huge wrench in my plans. <laughs> so, um, so I am living at home, learning remotely, and so I've experienced a lot of the negative feelings like loneliness, demotivation, anxiety, frustration, um, disconnection from, you know, campus and my fellow students <clears throat> and um, just like society in general. And um, but I've been just trying to push through it. I think hope has gotten me through a lot recently, just, I guess, hope for the future and that um, like next semester will be different. I know for my school, they're planning on welcoming most students back who wanna come back. So hopefully next semester will be better as far as that goes. And um, I'll be back on campus and with friends. And um, so, yeah, I feel like, um, I feel like I can definitely relate to what Mark said and just trying to see the positive, trying to see the silver lining, but, um, but yeah, there's also been, you know, a lot that we students have to deal with, so. Sure. Um, so not surprising, um, particularly those of us that have been working with uh, uh, young people, and I keep using that term and I don't mean that to be offensive. Um, you all are young people to me. Um, so, but resilience and in, 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 in young people being adaptive and creative, of course they are. Of course they are. They're, they're, they're persevering, maybe much more so than, than many of us. Um, so I'm not surprised that I'm heartened, of course, to, to hear that. Um, Haley, since you, you mentioned that uh, this semester you've been at home, um, how is uh, how are you thriving on an online experience um, only? How's it impacting your specific the specifically education and learning for you? Is this an environment you thrive in? So, interestingly. Um... When I was in high school, I actually did my first two years of online homeschooling. Um, I would like as a freshman and a sophomore, I did online. So I, I, I feel like I kind of have an, an advantage. Um, so during those like years of learning online for high school, I just developed more of an independent learning style. Um, and a lot of like self-discipline that I think has benefited me a lot in this situation, but obviously not all college students um, did online school at some point in their lives. So um, it's been a, a, a really drastic impact on a lot of us. Um, and even having that experience, obviously online, I feel like we can all agree that online school is just not the same as being in person. It's not the same as being on campus. It's not the same quality of education. And so there's a lot of frustration there. Um, and then 
I'm pretty sure most schools are still charging full tuition there. I mean, I haven't heard of any discounts, even though most, if not all um, classes for a lot of schools are online. Um, so there's just a lot of frustration there. And, um, and yeah, just especially feeling like it's not the same quality. Um, I definitely yeah. feel like my education, I feel like I haven't been learning as much in some of my classes as I could have if I were on campus. Um, so yep. yeah, it's definitely- No, that, 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 definitely that's, uh, definitely. You, you bring up several key points. Um, and, and it's glad that, that we're getting into some of that, right? Because um, there is just the learning style uh, differences between all of us and whether or not this environment is, is, is good for you in, or in terms of your learning. And then just reflecting on the, the reality of the quality, right? There, there can be some quality differences when we have to do it this way. I don't know if any of you are taking labs, for example, or in the sciences. I mean, that's a, that's a completely different experience. And uh, I know folks that are in music and, and, and that how that just is, uh, all kinds of disciplines are, are, are certainly affected. Um, Ahmed, uh, same question to you. How, how's this affected the way you feel like you're uh, learning and, and how your education is going? Um, I would say that um, we have here at Erlan, we have like a mix of classes. We are in, we are like having classes in person. We have the classes like that are half in person, half online. We have the classes that in labs, you go in person, but the lecture itself is online. So there is a variety of mix that each class, so it's going to be depending on the professor of what they actually decide on. Uh, generally, I feel that it has actually impacted my learning in both negatively and positively at the same time. Um, I feel that the quality of, of like of learning that I'm actually receiving, it didn't change here, but more than that actual the in-person experience that's like actually fully missing. Even though we have in-person classes, it's still kind of weird to have your friends like six feet apart from you or eight feet apart, or there's like a very like limited restrictions or the guidelines that we have to follow also, especially in labs. I'm in, I'm taking the labs and also I'm taking a music class. So that is interesting, like very, very um, different, especially because uh, I've took a lab before like last semester and I see the main difference in here and how, for example, I have to wait now longer just to do the same experiment rather than doing it next to the same bench just because we have quite a lot of students who are interested in the same class. So definitely it has impacted it negatively in that sense. But also here at Erlam, we had a change our academic plan from a whole semester to a seven weeks uh, mm. blocks that kind of add a challenge to it of adapting to how fast the stuff as, is actually going. So I, I believe that we, we did that in, into a terms that in case COVID has a big breakout again, it would be easier for us to transition online and to actually worry about two classes in seven weeks is much easier than worrying about seven or like four to five classes in like the 14 week a whole semester right. or traditional whole semester. So I feel that also in my personal experience has been positive just because I have only two classes to focus on and I have seven weeks to kind of uh, look at. But when it comes to science classes, that becomes quite a little heavy, to be honest, uh, because there's a lot of materials that we need to cover. And that sometimes adds a little bit of stress that you need to make sure that you're following the guidelines, but you're studying at the same time. And right. studying from your room can be a lot distracting. I think we all know that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, it's interesting. And just to say in the Erlen model real quick, Mark, um, uh, also maybe touch upon what it was like when things just halted in, in, in March, you know, of, of last semester. Uh, I mean, we all could plan for this fall semester a little bit, and even though it's way different, but everybody was impacted just all of a sudden uh, uh, last spring too. And so to talk a, a little bit about that in terms of your education. Yeah, so like you said, um, when we were halted in March, I think that was definitely the most challenging time for us. Uh, we never, we didn't have any technologies, you know, systems down. Um, there was a lot of technical issues going along. A lot of my classes like weren't doing video chatting just because we didn't, like I said, have the technology. So a lot of it was just going on Moodle, which is like our website. Um, so there wasn't really any interaction, which was definitely challenging. Um, so it, it, that was definitely a lot harder than, you know, like this fall has been. Uh, we 
are obviously back on campus doing what we, you know, at least can do somewhat of. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely very hard. Um, but it also, we were back home with our family, you know, we were able to kind of spend, spend our time doing other things rather than just school, which was also good to kind of clear the mind. Um, but nonetheless, it was, it was a challenge. Yeah, I, I can imagine, uh, Jordan, yeah, I saw you shaking your head a little bit with the things that have been said. Uh, please uh, let us know how your, uh, what your reflections are. Yeah, so like I said, I am a senior in the social work program. So my entire last year of learning is supposed to be like half practicum based. So mm -hmm. it has been a huge change up in how that is kind of done. Um, our council that accredits us has now like lowered the amount of hours we have to do because of everything that's going on. My practicum that I do through the Office of Health and Wellness Promotion on IEPY to campus transfers over to completely online on November 20th and I'm not allowed back on campus until February 8th. Mm -hmm. So it's been a huge learning impact and trying to figure out how to get my, like and my um, supervisors have done an amazing job of like making sure that I get the most out of what I need to learn and all of the competencies I have to check off while still being online and like doing what I need to do. So it's been extremely difficult to tra like transfer into this like completely online world. While I did take online classes throughout my college semester, it's way different from taking like one or two to being completely online and only having like, camp. we use Canvas for us and Canvas and Zoom and emails to communicate with my professors and my classmates. And I feel like this year has been more like busy work that the teachers give us a lot mm. and it's I don't see a lot of times the benefit into what I'm doing sometimes like discussion posts will be completely off topic from what we're learning that week and I have to like comment back to like three of my classmates and everybody's just like great job and it's not like that face-to-face -face interaction when you can really give feedback to someone especially in the social work program where we're trying to learn how to communicate with different populations and with each other and we had those like in-person aspects of like talking to each other and working through a problem we don't really have that anymore, which is really upsetting. And I feel like I'm kind of missing out on that portion of my education. But um, I think a lot of IEPUI faculty have done an amazing job of kind of going over the summer and figuring out exactly which way they wanted to um, present their classes or like support their students. And so I really appreciate that because Last semester was a really rough one for a lot of us. And sure. um, I had a class that I took, it was like two hours and 40 minutes long. And my teacher decided it would be a great idea to have us in class on Zoom for that entire two hour and 40 minutes every week. And it was really difficult, especially because I was at home at that point too, and trying to get my family to be quiet and like still <laughs> like work on things that they needed me to do. It it was just a time. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, interesting. Um, I, I think that, uh, well, it, it's, I'm amazed, but again, not surprised how you all are, are just kind of navigating these new waters, um, for sure. Um, one of the things that, that so many uh, folks in business talk about as being critical uh, that we want from uh, college graduates and, and, and is these soft skills, right? You hear this about being able to work in a group and being collaborative and all of these kinds of things. And while there will be plenty of opportunity for you all to, to get those and continue those experiences, um, I think uh, a lot about this kind of group work that is very much a part of a lot of uh, curricula these days uh, being impacted a little bit. But that said, you all will have a leg up on how to handle and do this. So many companies are, are learning that maybe they can operate in a virtual environment um, and keep their costs down because, uh, and so you all might maybe be even more equipped to handle the new normal um, in some ways. So we'll see. Um, Ahmed, you had mentioned um, you've, when you've been social, you've really just maintained the same kind of friendship uh, bubble. Um, and, and, and so how, 
t talk a little bit about how you've been able to kind of maintain that so that you get some social, you get that kind of element fed to you without maybe uh, putting folks in jeopardy health-wise. Uh, well, to touch on that, to give like a little bit background about Erlam, we are a very small school, so we have like a 700 students here on campus uh, right now, and then like like the rest of them are online. So we live in different dorms, and we have the policy for this year that you're allowed to interact with people who are like within the same dorm like you. So that I was really lucky to have most most of my friends living in the same dorm, and we also like we all kind of go and hang together in a social distance manner, of course, because you don't know how, especially with the classes, who you get exposed to. And this policy, I feel kind of, it minimizes your exposure to other people at the same time. So it would be easier if someone had COVID, it would be easier to contact the other people and trace where your interaction has been. But generally, I feel that, especially lately, we have been very fortunate to have like like kind of a pickup of events happening on Canvas. I am I am a member of the uh, student activity board here, and we do a couple of events mostly every two weeks for students to kind of either like have an event to pick up and go somewhere. Mostly, we try to do our events outside, so we have a lot of space, and there's like much less interactions. But also, like we ask for students to register, so we still have that. We still trying to have that uh, like social manner happening in, in Canvas for students to actually interact and socialize, especially with the, freshmen, with the freshman class, because we really didn't get to see them. And how we get to know them is basically people with masks. So I'm really surprised how we're going <laughs> to be in the future to see how, how is that class looking like. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's definitely challenging. And um, like, absolutely, the social interaction has been going down quite a lot. But we're trying to maintain it and i think the main key here is friends and making sure that you and your friends understand the fact that you kind of expose yourself to a specific amount of a group and that's what we agreed with my friends i was like if we want to hang together this is what has gonna has to happen because i'm not gonna help risk my health and risk other people's health when this comes to that and another thing we do is we have free testing happening all over indiana and i feel we go every single week once to just test and make sure that we are at the safe side it just feels really good and make sure that we're doing the right thing. So I feel this is, these are the ways that I've been normally myself here using throughout the days to actually make sure that everything is going and I do not have COVID yet. So yeah, that, that, that's interesting. To, it's almost like a, a, an, an implied or it's in your case spoken kind of social contract you have mm -hmm. with your peer group. Hey, I'm going to be responsible. You're going to be responsible. And if that's the case, then we can hang out and and, and, and then I love to hear that you're being tested regularly. That, that's great. Um, Haley, I, I, you mentioned you're at home right now, so I can only imagine how challenging it is. And then you're part of the sorority. And, and, and so some of those relationships and, and that would normally be functioning in football and all these kinds of things, right, have been severely impacted. So, so tell us a little bit about how you're navigating that. Yeah, so... For me, this one has been really difficult. Um, obviously, like our social lives as college students, you know, it's all part of the experience and doing online that takes that part of the experience away a lot, especially since I'm at home. Um, so for me personally, um, I've been able to stay in contact with close friends by texting them daily, um, talking on the phone, FaceTime, obviously social media has helped a lot in this, um, in these weird times. Um, unfortunately, I don't really get to interact with a lot of my other um, fellow students and classmates. Um, for the most part, I just get to chat with them in class. If we're put in like a breakout room um, on Zoom, uh, we can chat on there. Usually we ask how we're doing, how we like Zoom University, that kind of thing. Um, but that's unfortunately like the extent that my interactions go. Um, that's as far as they're able to go with me being online and at home. Um, I also, I'm in, involved in a lot of student organizations and leadership roles. So when we meet, I get to talk to um, my fellow students there. Um, but again, you know, that's on Zoom and that's, it's just not the same as being in person. Um, definitely not. And, um, and 
Although DePaul has done like a really great job at providing um, different virtual events for remote students since a lot of our, especially upperclassmen are doing online um, right now only. So um, I know they've done different events where they've had a comedian on Zoom, a magician, um, different things like that, which has been really cool. It's really great of them to offer those opportunities to us. And um, I know counseling services for, at my school as well, they've been doing a lot of support groups um, where students can hop on and chat and, um, and kind of foster community online. And um, so those have been really great. Um, I've taken advantage of some opportunities, but then you get like Zoom fatigue. I'm sure we've all heard of that term by now, but just mm -hmm. wanting to be done with, you know, your right. eyes glued to your computer screen all day, just um, so not really wanting to have to log on to Zoom for another thing that isn't necessarily mandatory, like classwork. Um, so yeah, uh, that's just definitely one thing that I'm looking forward to with being back on campus next semester, even with all the restrictions just seeing familiar faces in person, even if they're half covered with masks, um, yeah. it'll still be nice to, to like talk to people and be in their presence again. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Mark, uh, you mentioned that uh, baseball was, was uh, cut out uh, last spring, but I know this fall you all have been able to kind of in a socially distant way, you know, continue and hopefully the season will occur this year. Um, talk a little bit about that and your other relationships and how you're navigating that. Yeah, so I think definitely one of the biggest challenges so far, I think it'd be interesting to see if you guys talk to like freshmen or sophomores, because obviously like being a senior and junior, like this is not our normal. Um, granted, like freshmen wouldn't know what a college experience would be like. Um, however, like this is our senior year for most of us. So like three years of doing the same routine every time and then really being shaken up like this has been really challenging. Um, but as far as the baseball side, I kind of talked about it earlier. You know, we only see 10 guys every day and it's different, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the groups. Um, I think Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're with the same 10 guys. And then Tuesday, Thursday, you're with a different 10, but the same 10 every week. Um, so there's, I mean, there's guys on campus that I don't see that are on the baseball team hardly at all. Um, so that's hard being a senior, being a leader, like trying to reach out to them and do stuff with them on campus. It's just so challenging. Um, and I, you know, I feel for them because obviously I know what, you know, the ropes are like and how college is supposed to go. Um, but, you know, they don't. And it's a tough adjustment period for them. Um, so socially with the baseball team, it's it's been really hard to, to navigate that. Um, but as far as friends go, uh, I'm trying to do everything that I can. But kind of like Ahmad said, uh, we don't we have a lot of policies in place where we can't go out. We can't go hang out with people and do what we normally did. So. Um, it, it has been a struggle. Uh, I'm trying to navigate that just by reaching out to people as much as I can. Um, but it, it is, it's definitely the, the, the biggest challenge that I've seen with COVID. Yeah, yeah, I completely understand. Um, Jordan, you're set right there in Indianapolis. So I, I would, I mean, just to make some differences, maybe they're obvious. I mean, Earlham, uh, the two of you are in a, uh, campus within Richmond, but sounds like you're pretty restricted in, in term uh, restricted. I don't make it. Well, that's just the way it is, right? So a lot of protocols. There we go. Much positive word. Um, and then Haley's literally at home. Um, but you're here in Indianapolis, and and there's a lot more that I'm guessing is is available to you. So so how how's that working for you in terms of that temptation? Yeah, so IUPUI is a huge commuter campus and it's made it both like better and worse at the same time. Um, being in like a bigger city, I feel like there are a lot more um, mandates in place that um, kind of control like you have to wear a mask everywhere. And I know like my personally, like me and my roommates, we take like hand sanitizer with us literally everywhere we go because we live more out in like the suburbs a little bit. But I think my lifeline for this semester and even like into last semester has really been the organizations that I've been like that I'm a part of. And so one of the biggest um, aspects of my life, even before COVID, was my participation in fraternity and sorority life. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, I think we have done just an amazing job of making sure that we all really stay connected 
we actually were the first organization on our campus in fall to host like an in-person event following all of our like school's guidelines, which it was probably like 15 pages of guidelines. So it was very difficult <laughs> to kind of get through and actually like do it. So I think that was something that was like so special for us to like actually be like, okay, I can actually see them in person and I can wave hi to them and not so much like give anybody hugs and but just being able to like be in person with people was just an amazing experience um it was very difficult to not just like want to be like constantly next to each other but i think just even that one experience of us coming together and actually doing something together it was a fundraiser for our philanthropy so it was even more special for us but um it's been pretty difficult to stay in contact with people who i like want to talk to but like I don't have a connection with them through an organization or a class so like normally I would just like see them passing in the hallways of like our campus and now I don't get that especially with the majority of my classes being online it's been kind of difficult to like maintain those friendships or even like remember that I have those friendships because I'm such like an in-person like you're in front of me type of person so <laughs> it's been difficult but I think um, the organizations that I'm a part of have done just an amazing job of making sure we stay connected through online programs like we did an online escape room for my sorority one night which was so fun oh, wow. um, I had never heard of that before but no oh, I'd, I'd like way. to know more about that yeah it was just a great way for us to come together and like figure something out together so I think it really is dependent on the student and how much they're able to socialize because if you are at home or your campus is more shut down there aren't that many opportunities for you to get out and do things and luckily IUPUI has just been absolutely amazing and keeping like our COVID numbers really low like we get um, a weekly update on what's going on with our mitigation testing so they choose a random group of people to come in and be tested for COVID each week and then they give us the results from that so it's been really 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 helpful in making sure that we all stay safe and they're also offering free testing to us next week before we all go home for Thanksgiving, which I thought was absolutely amazing. So if you want to, you can just sign up for a time. You can go in and get tested just to make sure that you're not bringing anything home to your family if you are going home. Yeah, that, that's, that, I'm glad that so many of the, the colleges and universities are, are, are really making testing and, and those kinds of things available. Um, I just saw and. Uh, Dr. Fauci say yesterday um, that his own personal Thanksgiving is going to be, you know, virtual um, with his family um, for, for a variety of reasons. And everybody has to make those choices. I suspect um, Jordan and, and Mark are, are relatively close, even though they're out of state. They're, they're not big. They're car trips. Um, Haley's already at home. I'd probably like to go somewhere else for Thanksgiving. Um, but Ahmed, you alluded to it. I mean, when was the last time maybe you were home? Um, and he's from Palestine, by the way. And so, you know, it's not just like uh, going back to Cincinnati. So, Well, for me, my situation is a little bit more special because I'm originally from Gaza Strip. And so the, like, the Strip itself is like under the siege. So there's borders and stuff. So I haven't been home since I left home myself. But talking about my other international student peers, um, so it's been like a very difficult stuff. Most of the international students here at Erlem are studying online, but the ones who were able to actually study here, or the majority of them have actually stayed since the closure in March. And they stayed within the United States and then they came back. I was one of the, the students who actually stayed on campus over summer and over the rest of the semester. So that was like an interesting experience to have. Uh, absolutely would not sign up for it, but. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's something that we have to actually adapt with. And I think we made the most out of it in, in, in a sense. But as I hear from them, it's, it has absolutely impacted them. Some people would go for home, like, for example, in like for Thanksgiving and winter break. Now, um, we see like many of the students are trying to stay within the United States just because of the visa issues, because of the risks, especially seniors that if they have traveled and then there's another right. outbreak and then the borders closed with, the, yep. with like countries that's going to be basically for them not 
graduating or like they're gonna graduate by not being with their visa and graduating in, in a sense. So uh, that is like the, the biggest issue here, especially kind of going with the finance with like all of the other stuff that come with the international students, especially talking about financially, finding a place to live over winter and also like making sure that everything is okay and your visa is still um, working and when we talk about that, we talk about OBT and CBT as well. So there's quite a lot of factors when it comes to international students that colleges need to actually think about. I think Erlam has been doing really good in support of that, in my personal experience, um, either from the students part, students supporting students, or actually faculty supporting students. And we're trying to make sure that everyone is, like we are here for everyone, and we're trying to do the best that we can, because at the very end, we cannot control everything. So for sure um and 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 i appreciate you sharing that and and certainly not only your own experience but some of your peer group um yeah Erlem and, and and several of the folks on the phone come from colleges universities have significant international student presence so uh i'm sure that's a common uh, theme for many of us um so now i alluded to the beginning uh of this conversation about um uh, you know being forthright and honest and all that and here comes the hard question and um, so we'll try to pose it in a way that makes you feel the most comfortable um, as you know i can uh, exist uh, around public policy and reducing high-risk behavior on college campuses which uh, many of you have been on college campuses you know that's a hard uh, job <laughs> for all of us um, and, and 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 certainly the, the folks on the phone here are all committed to doing that um, we've seen um, nationally a spike, particularly in alcohol use, but other uh, substances during this time period among adults, um, for sure. Um, there have been some studies that it's, it's certainly on the rise as well with, with young people. Um, so help us understand, at least on the college campus, um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mark, uh, how have you seen your friends impacted <laughs> in, in maybe uh, alcohol use and substance uh, use and, and all that and what you know kinds of things uh concern you in that regard yeah um so for me personally it's not something that i've ever been drawn to um however it, there's really nothing else to do um to say the least so i can definitely see why there's been rises in substance abuse um it's kind of it's not the answer but at the same time like you know, it's the answer to some people because like, again, there's nothing to do on campus. So um, it's definitely common. I've seen it happen throughout. Um, however, you know, at the same time, people say, you know, college is a time to have fun. So it's hard to find that balance of like, are people like doing it like too much right now? Or is it, you know, actually a problem? Um, so it's just kind of judgment. Now, if that happens and continues to happen after college, then yes, there's definitely a problem. However, you know, college is a time to have fun. And that's really the only thing that we can do to have fun. So, um, so, so to that end, and, and again, just want to, and then we've heard both of you talk about what Earlham has been trying to do to, to create other things to do uh, on mm -hmm. campus to have fun. Um, so is there, from your perspective, Mark, what more, or, or differently can Earlham do to maybe help combat that? So I get that there might be some of that, but but we've seen an, an increase to the point where it's troubling. And so we just wanna just love your all's feedback and give you a preemptive for the other three of you um, to, to think about, because I'm gonna come to each of you. Uh, what more can the, your campus do, you think, to help kind of do this and provide you know safety and, and health for the students? Yeah, I think definitely just bringing awareness to it. Um, I think some people might not realize what's going on um, and that it can be something to fall to. Um, so if you kind of bring awareness to it and not shy away from like, you know, having these kind of conversations because a lot of people don't want to talk about it. However, if you are willing to bring it up in conversation, people are more than likely to start opening up and saying like, yes, I might need help or something like that. But um, I don't see it getting to that point yet, but it definitely would be a good option to have on campus too you know, make people aware of the situation. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, Jordan, uh, it's a little maybe more difficult um, since you don't have the same kind of campus environment. You do have some, but you know what I mean. Um, but but still, you see the the, the spike, right? And, and the increase. And, and believe me, and we're gonna see some numbers later this afternoon that are gonna show us 
this isn't a new issue. It's in some ways just a more intense one. So um, what are your thoughts in this area? Yeah, so I have the amazing privilege, like I said, to be a practicum student in the Office of Health and Wellness Promotion. And um, part of my practicum this year, I got to kind of see our data from our National College Health Assessment. And um, one of the aspects of that was substance abuse and alcohol um, usage on our campus. And while that was pre-COVID, it still was very like eye-opening to see those numbers before COVID. Um, Cause I think now, like Mark said, um, it's kind of a lot of people's like only option to have like some amount of fun. So I think it would be interesting to kind of see the data um, like from pre-COVID to like, what is it now? Mm. Um, I, that's something that I'd be like really interested in like seeing, cause I think it is something that people have been using more, but I also think on the flip side of that, like a lot of people that are home or, um, are commuters, like I am for my school, it could probably be less as well because they're not having those social interactions. They're at home with their families. And so there's nothing really that they're going to be doing with that, but, on the flip side of that, I think IEPY has done an amazing job of like spreading awareness um, for substance abuse and alcohol usage like this past semester. And I know in previous semesters, they have done um, a drive sober campaign where they have students sign up to pledge that they will always drive sober. And um, I know in the coming weeks, we're gonna have like a virtual mocktails event. So helping students um, still find like creative ways to make like fun drinks that are non-alcoholic. Um, so I think we are we are really supported on our campus by these initiatives and making sure that we know um, all the information that we possibly can about substance abuse. Um, I know like one of the free swag items they gave away in the past weeks was like a cup that had all, all the different alcohol um, levels of like what one drink is. And so that's information that students might not have known before having that. Mm. So I think they've done a really good job of kind of spreading awareness of it. Okay. Um, uh, Haley, uh Again, your experience is a little different, at least right now, but uh, back in March and, and, and just kind of things were occurring. And, and just again, when your own peer group, uh, how have you seen this kind of COVID impact people's use? And uh... Yeah, um, yeah, I definitely, I can't speak to on campus too much just because obviously I'm not there. Um, but I can definitely see how alcohol use and, and other substance usage would increase during this time. Um, like others have said, there's not a lot going on right now. And, um, you know, college students are still looking for outlets to stress, um, which is particularly high right now. Um, and a lot of students do turn to drinking um, to relieve that stress. Um, so I can definitely see how it would definitely, you know, be higher, but like others have mentioned again, I feel like awareness and just bringing attention to this and the increased usage, um, I feel like that would help students recognize that it's becoming an issue on their own campus. I feel like a lot of students take pride in the school that they go to and the campus that they live on. And I think that if they were made aware that this is becoming a problem, they would want to help address it. Um, I know something that my school's counseling services do and that I really appreciate and I know a lot of other students appreciate is they kind of take this approach um, that they know college students no matter what are going to drink. Um, so they don't take the approach of saying, hey, don't drink, don't do this, don't go out and party, don't go out and drink alcohol, you know, this and that. They just take the approach to where they want to um, encourage healthy drinking habits. So understanding your own limits, um, like Jordan said, what um, like what one drink looks like, what one alcoholic beverage looks like, how much alcohol is in a beer, wine, whatever. And um, I know like counseling services, I'm really involved in counseling services at my school and they offer a lot of sessions, a lot of different informational sessions to students um, just encouraging healthy drinking habits. 
So again, maybe just um, taking it from that angle too, because, you know, obviously nobody really likes to be told what to do. And at the end of the day, college students are going to drink. Um, so just trying to emphasize healthy habits instead of saying, no, don't do that. Say, do this, but make sure you, you know, know your limits, watch out for your friends, know the signs of, um, of alcohol poisoning and that kind of thing. Um, I think that's, I think that's a, just an overall better approach to it. Interesting. Um, you know, Jordan brought up an interesting point that, that maybe, you know, because there isn't the um, social gatherings, um, or they're not supposed to be, um, you know, off campus parties, if you will, or these kinds of things are occurring that maybe um, some of this has actually gone down and, it, and, and it'll be interesting to check out the data. But uh, by the same token, we, we've seen an increase to access with restaurants uh, allowing you to carry out alcohol now and um, and then uh, apps like Drizzly that allows you to, to have alcohol delivered and just a whole host of things that from an access standpoint that we don't all have to go to a bar that's now closed. We can actually get it in, in different ways and, and in some ways uh, maybe doing it alone um, and things like that. So there's just a, it, it'll be interesting to see the data. I certainly appreciate you all sharing at least your reflections. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised um, um, from what a lot you said. And I know that the campuses you represent really take the, uh, reducing risky behavior on campus seriously. Um, and so I'm glad that you all are reflecting that. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, so I've got one more question just to give the audience a, a, a sense here. I'm gonna ask just kind of one more question, but if you wanna start queuing up any questions for the students in the chat box, um, I'll uh, uh, be able to get to those here in a moment. Um, so you all have been singing the praises of your school and, and great. Um, and I'm not surprised, like I said, um, but there's always room for improvement. So um, Haley, you'd mentioned, and I'm not gonna get into the cost issue of your classes, right? That's a different conversation for a different audience. <laughs> um, but but what, what's one thing that you think the university could do more of or better at when it comes to just helping you all navigate this, this pandemic? Yeah, so I feel like um, just on the personal level, I think empathy is key in this time. I've heard a lot of horror stories from fellow students and, you know, I've had experiences my own um, where professors just aren't showing mercy. Um, they're expecting like the same quality of work from us, um, especially those of us at home, even though we're not getting the same quality of education. And that can be really, really frustrating. Um, I've heard of students who've are, who are at home or even on campus and they have an issue come up and they can't complete an assignment and they reach out to their professor and their professor basically says, tough luck, you know, these are hard times, but you're tough, you can do it. And I feel like that's just, that's not, obviously that's not supportive. and. It also gets really frustrating because there's a lot of contradictions, I feel like, um, because a professor or even like some of the staff members that I come in contact with, like advisors through different student orgs that I'm on, um, they'll say, you know, we want to support you guys. Like, what, what can we do for you? We want to be there for you. And then in the same breath, they'll, you know, have three meetings a week and assign a quiz and three readings and, um, and an essay all due on the same night. And it's like, it's a little too much. And I understand that, you know, that you know, professors in particular, they don't want their course to be less. Um, and they don't want their students to be, you know, to get less of an education, I guess, um, from them. And that's understandable. But this is such a different time. And I feel like if I feel like when it's different, when a semester is different in these special circumstances, we should treat it like it is. And I think a lot of professors are very, they're very much wanting to treat this like it's normal because they want it to be normal. 
but it's not. And I think, so I think the key is recognizing that it's not normal and just being right. empathetic and understanding that students are going through a really, really weird time right now. Um, and just trying to be more understanding of that. Um, I mean, I've had a lot of professors that have been incredible throughout this, um, but as far as the critical side goes, there I've heard right. horror stories from students who have been like crying or stressed or wanting wanting to drop out or wanting to drop classes because professors are just some of them are just being too much and not they they some of them are lacking empathy in a very strong way. So yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, um, Mark. I'll let you speak for for Erlen. Uh, Jordan, I'll come to you, and then we're going to go to some questions so that we'll uh, be able to uh, still stay to the 11 o'clock time period. So, Mark, you you chose the straw. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot similar to what Haley was saying. Um, I think one thing specifically with Earlham is just kind of staying true to what they've come up with for policies, um, specifically, like, <laughs> this is like a bad example, but we had a carnival, or like we had activities on the heart, which is like the center of our campus the other day. And like everyone was getting together, which was fine. But like from the athletic perspective, like we can't even practice as a like whole team when we're all negative on campus. It's like it's hard to find that balance between like making sure you're taking care of your students. But at the same time, you know, like a lot of us are we have a lot of athletes on campus. We all are here to participate in our sport and do what we can for our college. Um, so that's one thing that I've noticed. Um, another thing, too, is we used to have like two or three places that we could eat on campus um, and then minimize that all down to one location. Um, which is very challenging for people that like, you know, don't like that food necessarily. Um, and you know, it's, it's hard going in, getting the same food every day, day in and day out. Like you can't change the pace at all. Um, and like they have the staffing to open the other place. They just said there's not enough people on campus, which um, I kind of find that like hard to believe because there were definitely a ton of people going to the other place to eat. Um, but yeah, those are just kind of some of my, my things that I've noticed. I don't know if Ahmad has anything to add from the Earlham side of it. Uh, generally, I think uh, I like in the support section, like I'm, I'm very glad that our professors are very understanding. So I think that's really good. Uh, it's just like depending on like a main uh, good communication between you and your professor to make sure that everything is good. So in my in my side, I haven't experienced any of, of that. But at the same time, I feel talking back to the substance uh, stuff, I think bringing awareness to that is really important at this stage uh, for college students, even though it might not be the main issue at Erlen, but I feel that that would be something that Erlen could actually like draw the attention to because um, it is a serious issue and I, I can see it coming through like, but at the same time, maybe because of the seven week schedule, people do not have time to even like, uh, like drink or do anything, but at the same time, <laughs> with the pressure and everything so but also drawing attention is very important yeah uh, absolutely um jordan uh anything that iupy could what's one thing maybe they could be doing more of or, or, or better and then we've got a couple questions here yeah i definitely think that we need a little bit more access to counseling and psychological services on our campus i know mm -hmm. personally from a lot of friends that i have that have tried to reach out to our um, psychological services and they were put on a wait list for months trying to get um, help with mental health or anything like that. So I think our campus really needs to kind of expand that more, especially in these times, because I know a lot of people's mental health is taking a really negative impact throughout this. And I think also on the flip side of that, um, I'm lucky enough to be in a program where we speak freely about what's going on in our lives between our professors and our advisors. And so I've even heard from some of my professors that like they are also going through um, a hard time trying to prepare all of their classes for online or even teach in person that brings on a lot of anxiety. So I think making some more um, accessible yeah. mental health services for our professors and our faculty and staff as well. Yeah, no, it, it, all very good points. And I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, much like your all's life was impacted. Um, <laughs> you can only also imagine the faculty and, and, and folks um, having to all of a sudden, uh, you know, build a plane in midair. Um, so real quick, Haley, you might see this question. You're living at home, I imagine, parents and kids, do you have siblings, that kind of thing. What's it like to have to navigate that every day? 
uh, when you might have been used to just kind of rolling out to get food and it's always there and you know it's a different kind of a uh, uh, way of life just being at home yeah definitely um so i feel like i'm pretty lucky because i know a lot of students have really big families or younger siblings that they live with and they have to navigate um, learning at home with those kinds of distractions. I live with my grandma. Um, my, I, have, I do have siblings. My brother is older and he lives on his own. Um, he, right. He's graduated from college and whatnot. And my sister goes to Trine University, so she's on campus. Um, and so thankfully, the, I haven't really had distractions or anything. Um, my grandma is really understanding that, you know, I have my schoolwork and I have classes and I have different meetings online and, you know, I have a lot that I have to do. So she's very respectful of the fact that um, for the, like, for the majority of the day, I do need like my alone time in my own space to get my work done and to do my meetings and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, that's, I've been really lucky there. I'm really thankful yeah. um, for, that, for that side of things. Um, for the food and such, it has been kind of weird because, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to, like, you know, going to the dining hall and having food right. ready. So, um, but it's been kind of, that's been something that's kind of cool, I guess, because I've gotten to learn different recipes. And um, obviously, when you go to the store, there's more variety than, you know, your dining hall and at DePaul, we have one dining hall. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> so, right. um, and, um, so overall, I would say that it's been, it's been pretty great as far as that goes. I, I feel like I'm pretty lucky because I know a lot of students have, you know, younger siblings or parents who work from home and, um, and that provides a lot of distractions. So I'm, I'm lucky in that regard for sure. For sure. And I appreciate you sharing that. And I, can only imagine uh, if you're competing for uh, bandwidth on the internet, let alone, you know, trying to navigate just other life uh, uh, constraints. Um, so we've got a question here, and this is a question we ask regardless we're in COVID or not. Um, it's something that we're all challenged here on the, uh, this meeting today, we're all challenged with. So it's always take an opportunity when we have a student panel to wanna know this uh, question. So we're gonna to try to buzz through here. We've got about five to seven minutes left. Um, so I'm gonna read this question and then you all just think about it and then I'll come to you here. But what is the best way? You've all alluded to, well, more awareness and campaigns and you know things like that. But, but what's the best way um, for you or, or your peers to, to get that kind of information? Is it you know, we all get so many emails and texts. Is, is, it, is that the best way? Is it not? Is it through some sort of social media? Is it, is it better to have videos, you know, that might be coming through YouTube or Instagram? Um, or honestly, something getting in the mail, which you don't probably get a lot of mail. You know, a lot of us you grew up getting a bunch of mail. Maybe you all don't. So that might stand out for you. You know, help us understand that a little bit, um, just from your all's perspective, um, because it's something that will continue to, to try to do better. So Ahmed, I'm gonna start with you um, on that one and we'll kind of buzz around. Um, I feel like raising awareness should not be uh, like kind of excluded only for one specific part of communicating with students. It should actually utilizing all of these uh, methods that you actually use. Some students read mails, some students uh, read their emails, some don't. Some is really great reaching out from them like in social media, some just posters around Canvas or here at Ulam, we have TVs around campus, so you can like kind of see ads as well. So I feel like generally utilizing as much as, like as many as we, like ways to communicate with students as we can, students are gonna get that information. Also like, if I personally like see the information in my email and I was not really interested to read it, but then I saw it on social media, I was like, okay, this is the same information. Maybe I will read it now. So I feel like <laughs> communicating to the students into like many different platforms at the same time and making sure that they get that, I think that's the main goal from there rather than actually just excluding into one specific part of sending emails or like doing posters around campus. So I feel utilizing all of this um, right. option is really great. Um, that's, uh, 
it's good and then frustrating to hear that answer um, as people who uh, are implementing these. And so, Jordan, I, I get that that there are multiple disciplines. What with um, you or your peers, which one way is the most effective for you? And we'll just leave it at you and we'll extrapolate that to mean for everybody. Right. Um, I know personally, like my peers are very big into social media. It's um, something that I use on a daily basis. And I think one of the best ways that you can kind of get the message out there for students is to use students. Um, reaching out to students, asking if they want to record a video for you, um, seeing if they want to talk to their organizations or their peers about this um, wellness promotion that you want to do. Once a student kind of connects that it's another student telling them, I feel like they're more like, okay, now I kind of get it. This person has done this. Maybe I could do this too, instead of receiving just facts and information from it. And they're being like, oh, okay, like whatever. I know I'm a very, very big person and being like, oh, like I know someone who did this, maybe that'll be helpful for me. So really using your student base, trying to find those students that are willing to do this for you, I think would be really, really helpful. Interesting. Um, I, I love that idea uh, for sure. Um, the, I'm going to switch gears just real quick because I, I think I have a sense of that. Um, Mark, we're, we're getting ready to go on a, an extended winter break, um, right? We're all ending school a little earlier this semester than we normally do. What, what messages or, or, or support services do you feel like you need from Earlham during this time? Um, since it's going to be kind of this extended period that helps you stay kind of connected. Yeah, that's, it's a challenging, that's a tough question to think about because um, you know, I kind of hate to say it, but I think going home is going to be a nice refresher for a lot of us to kind of get away from school for a little bit and kind of get our mind shifted from something completely different. So I don't want to tell you guys like not to do anything. However, I know there's going to be people, <laughs> Leave us on, alone. <laughs> there's going to be people on campus and stuff that are going to probably need these kind of, um, you know, resources to vague to and talk to a little bit about what's going on. But, you know, for a lot of people going home, I think they just kind of want to clear their minds um, and, you know, just kind of refocus on what's important. So that's just my perspective. But it's probably not, you know, the, the good answer that you guys wanted to hear. But it, it's, it's just, an honest answer. That's, yeah. what, that's what I we're asking for today. And I heard your peers here. They were all shaking their heads. <laughs> well, that's, so that's good. That's good. Then. <laughs> <laughs> there seemed to be some universality there. Um, yeah. Any the other three? Anybody have a something else you want to add in, in that area? Just speak up. I, I don't need to call on you this time. Um, I would just say just make like what you're reaching out with impactful, not so much like, I think what you really need to look at is quality over quantity. Um, reaching out to students being uh, more so on that, like, how are you doing standpoint or what services do you need from us? Maybe asking that question could be really helpful and planning that instead of just sending out a whole bunch of things and then students just don't look at it anyway, just really tailoring it towards um, what, the students need in that standpoint. And I know that's kind of like an open-ended thing, but all campuses are different, all students are different. So it's a little bit of a tricky situation. And I know, like Mark said, I'm kind of excited to take a break <laughs> from schoolwork. So if you can make it fun, that would be the key there. <laughs> nice. Um, well, I, I can't thank the four of you enough for taking an hour out of your, your, your schedule and, and, and time with us today. It, it's been for, for us to kind of navigate the subject um, and, and really as professionals on, on these campuses really, you know, consider um, what you all have said and, and continue to meet the needs that you all have during this time. So I certainly appreciate that. We're all giving you a virtual uh, round of applause. Um, just a, a housekeeping note before I throw this to Lisa. Um, in the chat box for everybody, there is a link to SurveyMonkey about midway down. Um, please, uh, uh, before we head on our break, click on that and, and it's just a handful of questions. It it's allows us question. to get some feedback. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. All right. It's one It's one question, so we'll One take question, there you go. So there you go. So it'll take no time at all. So definitely do that before we head out on break and then Lisa, talk to them about again, how we're coming back out of break.
Thanks again, have, guys, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciate your joining us. I know you're busy with your, I have a college son as well. So I know you're busy with everything you're trying to juggle. So really appreciate your perspectives. We always love to hear from you, the people we are working for on our campuses. So thank you all very much. And I hope you have great uh, breaks when you get home, however long those might be. And uh, we promise we won't bug you too much. Be nice to your parents though, because we're not used to having you back home either. So just remember that. <laughs> um, we will uh, go on a, a little, you have a few minutes to take a break. Please be back either here with the original link um, or if you're joining group two, go to the new link and um, we'll hear from our mini grant uh, recipients for this year and the great work they've been doing and we'll have uh, some rich discussion about that and um, and then there will be a, a brief uh, survey after that as well so make sure you take those too and then we'll move right into the lunch break when those mini grant sessions are over but please be back and ready to uh, go before our next uh, session at 1245. I have a little something to share with you about the legislative session before our legislators are on the panel. Um, so go get your coffee or let your dog out, whatever you need to do. And we'll see you back at 1115 in one of our rooms. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks, guys. Hopefully we have everybody here. Is uh, Catherine, Jane, and April all on? I see Jane. Maybe they're not yep. back yet. Maybe not. April says, I'm here. Katie says, hi, Harry. And Jane is there somewhere. April, do you want to start? Yeah. Uh, describe the your mini grant, the focus, the the need for it, and then maybe some of the things you've learned. Sure, I'd be happy to. In April, I do have. I believe you sent a PowerPoint, right? I did. Yeah. You want me to put that up? I'm happy to do that. Um. Sure. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Let me um get that going and figure out how to share my screen here. Um, okay. I have it pulled up on my end too, if it's easier okay. for me to share. Well, that might work. I will make you a co-host. All right. So there you should be able to. There you go. All right. Perfect. And all right. Um, so we used our um, or sought funding for substance-free programming and education. Um, we ha had started a, a program called Spartan Choices um, through a, an NCAA Choices grant um, several years ago. And once that funding ended, um, we have continued to seek funding to continue um, providing those resources and um, programming events for students. Um, so it involves a lot of late night substance free activities and education and programming. Um, and so our attendance had been, um, we have a relatively small campus. So we have a, about um, 1,100 undergraduate students on our North, North Manchester campus. Um, so in general, attendance is relatively low at most things just because um, we, we have a smaller campus. Um, so we had a goal of increasing that attendance and participation, um, looking at, as the, some of the students said on the student panel, kind of how do we access students? 
Um, so through um, email, through um, various marketing opportunities, um, starting an Instagram page for our, um, for our program. Um, and our, our goal was a bit lofty. Um, so we did see an increase in attendance, um, but rather than 25%, it was 10.6%. Um, and at each event, um, we, we would offer um, some kind of educational information and we tried to tie it to the event. So um, every, every fall we do a hall crawl um, where we have um, Res Life involved in that, in that initiative and um, provide a mocktail and a game, a party game. Um, and then Spartan Choices role is to provide the party bus. Um, so we use one of our people movers on campus um, and provide um, transportation. And the, the educational focus around that specific event um, was on um, making sure that you have a designated driver um, and kind of responsible attendance at parties. Um, so we provided, as people would get on the the party bus, um, we would provide them with that educational information. Um, and, and another goal we had around this substance free programming was that 75% of participants would retain knowledge gained during programming um, when surveyed one week later. So our, our goal really was about retention of knowledge. Um, so we would provide them with the information and then I would, uh, we have a tracking system that allows us to track attendance. Um, and I would send out an email to those who had attended. Um, the tracking system also allows us to gather the NOMS data that we need um, for reporting through, um, through ICANN. Um, so the goal was 75%, um, and we saw 88% of participants retain that knowledge, um, which, um, which felt like a big win for us. Um, the other thing that we have noticed um, through the the substance use survey that, um, that ICANN connects us to um, is that we, we noticed a decline um, in reported use of alcohol and marijuana. For, we do the, we participate in the survey every two years. So um, in 2017, I believe, to 2019, um, we saw, and I don't have those percentages with me, but um, we, we did see declines. Um, in that reported use. So our goal really has been to maintain that decline, um, but we won't participate in that survey um, until this coming spring. Um, so that outcome we have not yet um, measured or determined yet. Um, one of the other um, areas that we have used funding for, um, we did, I think it was two years ago, and then we did again this past cycle um, was to seek funding for motivational interviewing training for our university safety staff. Um, part of our, our concern is that we have relatively regular turnover with our safety officers. Um, and so those who had been trained a couple of years ago through grant funding, um, some of those are no longer employed. And so we have new staff that wanted to train, unfortunately, um, due to COVID, we were only able to get two of them trained prior to um, moving to remote learning in the spring. Um, we, we have found uh, motivational interview, interviewing training through a community corrections program out of Allen County, um, which fits really nicely um, with, with our university safety because it offers um, that um, kind of law enforcement perspective. Um, so there are lots of motivational interviewing training opportunities, but this one in particular is helpful for our safety officers because it comes from that kind of corrections philosophy, um, which our safety officers can relate to really, really well. And it, it's kind of specific um, to those who are working in that capacity. Um, but they currently do not offer um, a remote option or a, a, an online option for that training um, because there's so much interactive, there are so many interactive components. Um, so this has kind of really just been on hold. I don't, I don't have a creative way of getting our officers trained um, through that specific program. Um, so our goal really had been about um, the interaction between safety and students. Um, around uh, after they had been trained, what we were hoping um, was that we, we would send out a survey to 
um, students who had had interactions with Stacy um, following that training and that we would see um, at least 70% of student responses indicating a positive, sorry, <laughs> sorry, the mail just came and my dog is excited. Um, but that, that um, at least 70% of students would indicate um, positive interactions with university safety. Um, and we would have a, a Likert scale. Um, so that would either indicate an agree or strongly agree response. Um, however, um, with only two of our safety staff um, able to be trained, we don't feel like that we would get a, a fair representation if we did that survey now. Um, so we are really hoping to hold off on doing that until we can can finish out that, um, that training. Um, the other things that, that I wanted just to share are some of the, the marketing materials or advertisements that we put together um, that we have shared with students um, out of the grant funding. So hey, one of the, April, yeah. let me ask a, let me ask a yeah. question. So in the past, did you when you did MI, did you do that survey? We did not. Um, that was new for, for this time. And so, yeah, that's a good question because it would be useful to compare the data, yeah. um, but we did not do that previously. Okay. So that's this it. is this is one of the um, one of the marketing material items that we put together um, with some of the funding from from the ICANN grant. Um, we try to promote our medical amnesty policy across campus. And so this was one of those educational components as well. Um, part of what, what we learned just kind of anecdotally is that we can share information with students, but if they aren't in a position to really um, need that information, it's hard for them to retain it. So we would share information about medical amnesty through our, um, we had a panel, a student panel um, every fall during our week of welcome when students, when first year students come to first come to campus. Um, and we talk about um, alcohol and substance use. Um, and we talk about our medical amnesty policy there. Um, but it's not a, it's, it's not a great opportunity for students really to retain that information um, because many of them think they won't ever need it. Um, or by that point, they're exhausted by everything else they're having to participate in. And so we really looked at how, how and where could we put information um, that it would be accessible when they had a need. Um, and so one of the things that, and, and when I say we, I'm talking about um, myself and, and a group of um, faculty and staff who meet together in a, in a collaborative team and also my student workers. Um, and we realized that most often when students are in need of this, um, they might end up in the bathroom. And so we decided to, um, to look at window clings. Um, they actually have mirror clings that can stick on the mirrors. Um, so we, we put these together um, and put them in all of our um, common bathroom spaces in residence halls. Um, and so we're actually looking to, to make more of these because um, usually at the end of every, um, by, the, by the end of each academic year, they're, they have gone missing. Um, but that seemed to be a pretty good initiative. Um, I, don't, I don't have any data um, to, to track that. And so that might be something also for us to continue looking at is um, even just kind of including that in a survey to students, how many of them saw these, how many of them benefited from them. Um, but that is one of the things that we put together. Um, other marketing materials. Um, this was for the hall crawl that I mentioned. Um, this year we're doing this again, but we're having to get a bit more creative uh, around COVID regulations. So we will no longer have a party bus option. Um, and we've actually moved it um, to a different location um, outside of the residence halls where we can, um, we can better socially distance um, and, and have better access for students. Um, and then um, I think this is my last slide, but this is one of the other uh, activities um, we, we try to collaborate with a variety of other campus organizations um, and clubs um, so that we can um, have the best opportunity for attendance. Um, so our um, Artists Anonymous Club um, actually has quite a bit of attendance across campus. Um, and so we, we collaborated with them regularly, particularly because um, one of the main focuses of our programming was on um, stress reduction 
as it as stress often correlates to the use of substances. Um, so we did, um, and I can't even think of what they're called now. Um, that has escaped my brain. Um, anyways, we did a lot of stress um, stress reduction based activities. And I oh, and this was sorry, I'm moving too quickly. I apologize. There we go. Um, this is my last slide. Um, this was one of the other initiatives that we put together um, with ICANN funding. Um, every spring, we do safe sacks for spring break, um, and we provide a variety of um, safety items or educational information. Um, we get BAC cards from the Gordy Center. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we, we include. We, we often collaborate with the Center for Health and Sports Medicine um, on this initiative where they can get us, um, they often provide the sunscreen and, and lip balm and those kinds of items. Um, and then we put everything together in a, a cinch bag um, and give those out right before spring break. Um, so that's one of our other initiatives. Does, does anybody have any questions? All right, I don't see any in the chat. Um, no, I do have one quick question or comment though. This is Tammy. Uh, yeah. Um, the only thing I want to mention is we sent one of our uh, police captains to basics training a few years ago and he loved it. He said that you know, he, he really felt like it helped him learn how to do his job better. So I love the idea that you're doing that with your safety team. It was um, motivational interviewing training as a college specific. This was um, brief alcohol screening intervention. So, but so it's the same concept, you know, of motivational interviewing. So that's a really good idea. Thanks, Tammy. Yeah. Um, and the motivational interviewing training that we send our officers to is not college specific. It's, it's um, based out of Allen County Community Corrections. So it's a um, public community corrections agency that provides that. But I do like the idea of doing that basics training also. Tammy, if you have that information, I would love to have that. I, 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 I'll look for we, it. <laughs> we'll, we'll find, hey, hey, we can find it and send it to the whole group. Because uh, yeah, we just, we had some basics training that we And it may uh, have been that's what we last sent year. to. Yeah. Um, all right, that, that was really great, April. I, I'm kind of sad you didn't show us the na nearly naked mile. Um, <laughs> Yes, we do that every year also, although not this past spring. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on with uh, maybe uh, Catherine or Jane, whoever's on. Catherine, you want to go? Sure, I can go. Let me get my video here. All right, everyone see me? Yeah, we can. Fantastic. So I did send Eric a couple of slides as requested. I don't know if that's available. Um, Lisa, yeah, have I those? have them. I will try to pull them up while you're talking. Okay. Um, so I was I was glad that we were able to get a couple of students to participate this morning. Ahmed and Mark both gave you a good glimpse into how unique and different our campus is. Um, two totally different experiences coming from each of them this morning, which I think is helpful to highlight some of the challenges that we struggle with here in meeting all of the needs of our students as do most of us on college campuses. But um, just a little bit about, um, I also have it pulled up, fantastic. Um, a little bit about Earlham. We are in the easternmost portion of Indiana. We pull a lot of resources from Wayne County in general, um, Indianapolis, of course, and then um, Western Ohio, um, Dayton area. Um, with regards to what we were focusing on this year, if you want to go to the next, yeah. Um, we really are continuing our focus with um, self-awareness -aware and uh, behavior change with our students, and along with that, um, normative education. Through a lot of our research that we've done in the past few years, we continue to struggle with um, a perception challenge of use um, on our campus. Um, even though our numbers are high <laughs> for use of substances, um, higher than the Indiana and the national average, our perception is way up there, you know, hovering in the um, low 90th percentiles for um, both 
alcohol and marijuana use on campus. Um, so we continued to uh, focus our efforts on those areas. Some of what we did um, is facilitation of our life skills and leadership development course, which includes among other things, in particular bystander intervention, uh, which we use step up at this current time, or we did in the spring, values clarification, skills training, talking about uh, drink refusal, smart drinking habits, um, BAC, all of those things, and then tying in to that and then um, outside of just that development course normative education so what our rates are as compared to others um, and just trying to re-educate those students and then um, new this past grant cycle we brought back um, some substance free programming out of our particular area with late night at the rec um, it went, went over really really well um, and I can talk about that when we get to the outcomes section, which is next on that. So one of the goals that we identified was to um, reach at least 30% of our students. And thankfully we were able to exceed that goal in the spring. Um, the substance-free programming alone, we reached just over 30% of um, students and those were unique students that, that attended those programs. So we were really satisfied with that. Um, students really embraced it. It was something new, it was something fresh. We took advantage of all of the space we have here in the rec center and all the resources we already had at our disposal. And then we coupled that with some substance-free programming. Um, didn't really shove it in their face, but rather we provided it to them when they were coming in to get their free giveaways and you know all the, the nice things that we provided to them during that event. Um, we were, another one of our goal was also to see and try to gauge where we're at with our perception and use on campus. On, on campus, unfortunately, due to the time that we um, had to, uh, leave campus due to COVID, we were not able to facilitate our spring um, survey as we had intended. We always do that just prior to spring break. And um, with a number of other things, um, we were not able to facilitate that. However, we are happy to say that we've seen a reduction in our um, substance violations. Um, so you have those there. Both alcohol and drug violations are down. Um, thankfully, we have seen also this year ex extending, um, I think, from all the efforts we've done the past few years. And then also students focus is a little bit different with the current schedule we're under. Um, we've seen a reduction in our um, violations in the res halls, which has been great for us. And then um, another item that we received grant funding for was bystander intervention um, through the green dot, um, which is altruistic. And that's the next bullet. Um, we were set to, to attend that in March. Unfortunately, that one um, was canceled, that Green Dot Institute, for obvious reasons to, uh, due to COVID. And then um, we were registered to participate here in um, October. And unfortunately, two of the individuals, in addition to myself, I was able to attend, but two of the individuals um, were taken away from the office. Um, so they were unable to participate in that. So we're now um, out to January, 2021 for that Green Dot Institute, uh, which is a virtual institute. And then some of the program materials that we utilized are next. Um, the infographic that we um, provided to students and the um, information that they took away with them from the, from oh. the uh, rec late night event. Yeah, it's that one right there. Um, we basically bought these nice big water bottles and we shoved it with some information, one of which was those. We had BAC cards available. Um, we had little reminder stickers, um, which I did not include as a resource image, but we um, put a lot of information on this particular infographic um, along with some of our normative um, rates and information on campus. We plugged in um, our alcohol policy, medical amnesty, all of those good things. And then <clears throat> the next is the alcohol education poster. We posted those in the rec center, um, health and counseling, the student center, and then each of the residence halls upon entry, they um, placed it in the first um, entry point or main level of all of the residence halls. Um, and that was something, again, um, some myths, 
fact um, buster when it comes to alcohol, um, how alcohol affects your academics, and then also a little normative plug for um, some of our use here on campus. And then last but not least, um, that's not really a program material, but it is Green Dot for Colleges, which is um, what we had identified as our next step with our social change here on campus with bystander intervention. We currently do step up. We've done that for a few years, but it's there's such a large focus on um, student athletes with that program that we um, wanted to take it kind of the next step further. We really do struggle with a divide here on campus with um, our student athletes and then our non-student athletes. They have completely different outlooks on what the campus experience should be like and they also experience campus differently. Um, so for us to better meet the needs of our students, we had identified Green Dot. We had been to a number of in, um, professional conferences that have spoken highly of it and we want to hopefully facilitate that on campus. Um, with Step Up, we did this year in effort with athletics and Title IX also um, roll out One Love um, with our new Title IX coordinator. Um, so that's a little bit about what we have done here at Earlham. Um, we'd love to have had a little bit more progress with things in addition to ICANN outside of ICANN, but um, with our students spread globally across the United States and then internationally working across different time zones, all of our prevention efforts became crisis management efforts. Um, so that really took our focus away from a lot of the awareness and education that we were doing to um, better meet the needs of our students at that given time later in the spring. So, I think that's, uh, that's very common with the, the, a lot of the colleges that um, the, the special skill set that you have in the wellness departments of a university kind of lends itself to what COVID really needs from you know, the mental health uh, the mental health support and the different kinds of uh, programs that students need most right now with depression and other things. Um, uh, do you what? What was the uh, One Love program? What did that involve? So that was um, something that Title IX and athletics partnered with on just rolling out. Um, basically self-awareness, having compassion, empathy, and love towards one another. Um, they started working on that and rolling it out around Valentine's Day. There was a big Valentine's Day push. Um, and then they um, didn't get to progress into further programming as we were all migrating away from campus, but they had a one day event of just self-love and um, healthy relationship building and awareness on healthy relationships. So conveniently located after the football season. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, you've done a great job of, of moving your whole program from what I would say was not so much evidence-based to everything is evidence-based. And I really want to congratulate you on that. Um, just from reading your mini grant uh, proposals over the last, you know, four or five or whatever you've had. Um, I think it started with just pretty much campus speakers, and then you've gone okay. to this whole um, coordinated approach with a uh, with a team. And, and anything you want to talk about in terms of the progression of that and how much success you've had? I think the the progression has been somewhat of a forced progression. Our students on our campus really challenge us, <laughs> and um, in order to meet their needs best, we are. Um, and to have the best defense is, you know, sometimes programs are well embraced and sometimes they're not. Um, we have founded, put everything into just best practice and evidence-based because at the end of the day, if they wanna argue with us, that's our argument um, is that this is well-informed, it's evidence-based and we know it works. It's been shown to work. Um, so that's been the biggest driving force. And then also the success that we've seen um, with it and the, the people that we currently have at the table um, are very invested um, in supporting those, those efforts. Um, I think a lot of the success that we've seen with student engagement and their um, involvement is honestly the type of students that we get at Earlham. They're very socially 
uh, justice minded. They have vested interest in it. A lot of the students we have assisting us with our programming efforts have personal struggles themselves or know someone very close to them that struggles personally with substance and alcohol use. So we have good student support when we get it. Um, they are students that are really invested in the cause, which is helpful. In driving and your that. campus coalition, uh, your team has people from different departments or Yes, it's widespread. So we have a substance use working committee um, or working group, and then there's representatives from health counseling and wellness, student life athletics, um, public safety, the faculty, um, staff, and um, in the student body as well. So Great. it's all represented and kind of has touches all over campus. Well, that coalition is so important. That's what the, the, the schools that have the strategic prevention framework grants that's their first task is to build healthy coalitions on campus. And, um, and from there, they get a lot of great input and, and buy-in from all the other departments so that they're not alone in their task. Um, that's great. Any, any questions for Catherine? I have one, um, this is Tammy. What percentage of your students are athletes? Um, the incoming class for this academic year is 40% student athlete. We're generally oh. hovering between 30 and 40%. I believe we're right at about 35% this academic okay. year. For and athletes. how many students do you have overall? A thousand? Two thousand? No, we're under a thousand. So we currently have total enrollment enrollment this year, right about 725. Oh, okay. Um, and it's under that, that's on campus. Okay. This current time. We just graduated our largest class last year. So we're seeing a dip in enrollment after that large class has matriculated on. All right. Okay, Jane, are you there? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm here. Lisa, I don't, do you have the, the slides? Because if you do, that would be great. If you could show them, if not, that's okay. Um, I don't remember getting any. Did you send them to me or Eric? I sent them to you on Tuesday. Okay. Well, let me look while you're talking and I'll okay. see. Okay. Okay. And Tammy's here. And so this was a team effort between myself and Tammy. So um, we'll both be um, contributing to this report. But I'm Jane Krause and I'm, I'm here to talk about the mini grant received by Purdue here in West Lafayette which is associated with a very successful initiative here at Purdue, which is our lunch and learn sessions for faculty and staff. And Tammy Lowe at Purdue has been in charge of these sessions and I have, that's perfect, thank you very much. But I've had the sincere pleasure of working with Tammy on this initiative since 2015, Tammy. I think that's when we started. Wow. So okay. we're, going, <laughs> we're going into our sixth year. So um, in some ways it seems longer, in some ways it doesn't. So. The sessions, guys, are designed, as it says on here, to raise awareness about substance abuse and mental health related issues. And the faculty and staff that, are, that attend learn about campus, the campus environment, campus resources, ways to incorporate the information into their teaching and interaction with the students. The sessions are 50 minutes long and they're held pre-COVID time. We held them over lunch and we offered box lunches to the attendees. The mini grant allowed us to invite and fund two expert speakers from off campus to come to Purdue to talk with our faculty and staff. So we thank ICANN very much for the mini grant. The first speaker that I think you'll all be familiar with was um, Dr. Amy Peek, who is a pharmacist and a faculty member at Butler College of Pharmacy. I'm, I'm here at Purdue in the, in the College of Pharmacy. And Dr. Peek spoke at the ICANN conference one year ago on vaping and e-cigarettes. And that's what she covered for us as well. And that session was on Friday, February 14th on Valentine's Day. And we had two sessions with Dr. Peek, one session for faculty and staff. And then we had a second session for the public health graduate students that were able to attend. So we received excellent feedback on Amy's presentation. She really is a fantastic and knowledgeable speaker. Our second session, we invited Dr. Christine Chaplow, a psychiatrist, and at the time she was with IU School of Medicine. I think she's in private practice now. And we asked her to speak on the impact of social media on mental health. That was scheduled for April 16th, this past spring. So you know what we had to do with that session. 
But there was so much going into that, so much interest in our session that we had to close the registration and open a second one. But due to the pandemic, we had to cancel the sessions. And at the time of cancellation in mid-March, we had over 100 faculty and staff registered, which would have been our largest lunch and learn. So we hope to have her speak to us somehow this spring semester. On um, the second slide, perfect, thank you very much. Dr. Peake's presentation, we had 58 faculty and staff and graduate, the public health graduate students attend. Her feedback was consistent really with the overall feedback for all the lunch and learns. We ended up having six um, lunch and learns last year. And then you can see what they, they're very high numbers. 99% rated the session as excellent or very good. 97% said they learned information about how to interact or incorporate it into their teaching or interactions with the students. They gained information regarding resources on campus related to the topic and that the sessions helped them better understand the campus environment. But then more importantly, the attendees take the information back to their departments and share the information with their colleagues and with their students. So the ultimate impact is huge, but really unknown. It just starts at the lunch and learn and then it goes back to the, um, it just grows from there. We did impact, we do know this, we did impact 80 departments or offices on Purdue's campus last year through all the lunch and learn. So we had that many departments present at a session, which is an 11% increase over the year before. So again, this initiative has been very successful on Purdue's campus, a super large campus where the communication, this helps with communication. Um, Tammy, the one thing I just wanted to add in here and then I'm going to turn it over to you, but I wanted to add how we started this because we started this prior to 2015 when we started. So maybe 2013, you know how time marches on. I kind of forget when we did this, but Tammy and I surveyed and we just started with the faculty in the College of Pharmacy where I'm at. And we thought we had enough information from there that we just threw the lunch and learns out of that. But we asked them. If we ask those faculty if they knew how to help a student in distress, do they know about resources on campus how, and how to refer a student? And do they understand the campus environment surrounding substance abuse and mental health related issues? And the results of the survey told us the faculty were not knowledgeable about this. Well, I'm faculty and I, and I wasn't really sure where to refer a student. So they weren't not knowledgeable about these topics it, but they did agree it would be important for them to be knowledgeable because they do interact with the students. They do often notice things about students. And so, and then we also asked them, how would you like to receive this information? And they said they would like to receive it through short information sessions. So that's really how the um, learn, Lunch and Learn started and were designed from, from the results of that survey. But Tammy, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know you could talk all day about these and <laughs> campus improvement yeah. team. And these are really, you know, I, I love these things. Um, <clears throat> we used to have an alcohol summit every year where we would bring together really 80 to 100 people across campus who would talk about, or we would, you know, educate them on with information on things that we wanted them to know that they could talk about with students because you know, for us, our approach has always been filtering down of information from top to bottom so that information isn't just presented by our office um, or the police department or, you know, the, um, the res, res life that this was the responsibility of all of us to impact our students. So we would have, we had these, we actually had um, alcohol summits starting in 2006 or seven when we had a a grant from the Department of Education. And, and so we just continued uh, after that with those. With the campus improvement team, which started in 2011, um, we got to a point where we started thinking, is this really the right approach? Are we really getting the right audience? Because we would get the same people every year uh, who would come back and we would get, you know, maybe 80 to 100 people, but um, it just wasn't as we just didn't feel like we felt like we were missing something. So Jane started talking about wanting to survey faculty and staff. And that was at that time, we were part of the learning collaborative on high risk drinking, which was the study out of um, Dartmouth. 
we were part of that team. And so we did this, this survey, uh, Jane said, I'm going to do the survey. And I thought, okay, you know, we're, nobody's going to respond to it, but she did. And people did respond. And we got some information that really helped us look as a campus improvement team on how do we change this to impact people so that more people on campus are uh, reaching out to our students. So it isn't just one time a year, it's several times a year that we're giving them information that we think is important. And so we started this and it was a hit from day one, really. Um, and I think over our five years of doing this, we've established quite a bit of street cred around our campus because it's amazing when you hear the academic advisors say, hey, when are your lunch and learns this year? Because we'd like to put it in all of our academic uh, advisors schedules or you hear from uh, professors in different departments who you, you know they email Jane afterwards and say this is how I incorporated this into my teaching or you have a professor that reaches out to you and says my kid has a um, has a drinking problem and what I learned from this session is that I'm going to help do this 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 and this so um, it has been really um, a true joy to work on this. And the first probably year or year and a half that we did this, Jane and I were kind of stressed out as we were putting these together. Jane says this was me, it wasn't me, it was us and our whole campus improvement team. Um, but it, you know, we would, we would start, we would do this and we, do we have this, do we have this, do we have this, do we have this? And, and then all of a sudden, you know, we would, we stopped stressing about it. And, you know, I would go to work and I would go, what's going on? Oh, my kid, my schedule today. Oh, we have, a, we have a lunch and learn because it became so much like clockwork and the events really run themselves that we got to a point where it wasn't a stressful activity for us. Um, one of the challenges I think that we faced because we do get grants from two different sources, um, the Drug Free Coalition of Tippecanoe County and ICANN, we can't use any of the money from ICANN for food. So we're providing a free lunch to people and we know that's a draw for some of these folks, but uh, we had to really think about, you know, where are we gonna get the money for that? Fortunately, our Drug Free Coalition also believes in us and they see the impact of what it is that we're doing. And we've invited them to attend several of the Lunch and Learns over the years. I would say some of the challenges that we have, one of them is a good problem. Sometimes we have people show up that didn't register and we run out of lunches. Um, but I think the challenge with COVID is really gonna change everything. And, and I'm not sure what that's gonna look like and how we're gonna continue, well, how Purdue's gonna continue. Um, but it has been a true, true joy to work on this with Jane and with the campus improvement team. So. That's that's my spiel. Hey, um, Jane or Tammy, uh, in the afternoon, isn't there an afternoon session that the speakers usually go to a department and speak? They have. They have. Some yeah. of the speakers have done more than one session. Um, they've done them with students, uh, but they've also gone to residence halls, so that yeah. a lot of the um, managers of the residence halls could be trained or Jane has also worked with sorority advisors um, or house moms and sororities that can do that or people in Greek life. So we've tried to find with some of them the best approach. Jane, what else do you have to add to that? Yeah, no, that was right, Tammy. I, I had to think about that, especially with these invited speakers we're bringing in from off campus, we would have just exactly what you guys just said, Harry and Tammy, we would have a second session and and we had um, best practices with, with sororities and fraternities, and we had two experts from off campus come and we had a session, a second session with the house moms yeah. from the sororities and fraternities, was that cool or what? Yeah. And, um, and that was very neat. So yes, yes, we do have those second sessions. Um, we, we had Dr. LaHood, Amy LaHood come in too. Yeah. Right. Also a speaker from from one of the ICANN conventions, and she came twice. Yes, twice. and did and did second sessions for for us. 
you know, Tammy, mm -hmm. we we started with two lunch and learns the first year we did it. Really? And then the next year it evolved to six. And then ever oh. since then, we've had eight. Wow. We've had eight. I know. I had to look back at all that. It, and what you're saying is exactly right. Because one time Tammy said, Jane, I was going to take today off. And then I saw we had a lunch and learn. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. So, yeah. But it's been, it's been, we really appreciate the, the support. And uh, this is Lisa. I attended, and I think Harry has attended one too, or, and Eric, <clears throat> but I attended one that was actually um, with students, which I found very interesting and eye-opening. They were quite honest about their answers when we were talking about um, substance use. So um, I think they're very well done and we are happy to support you and however, whatever shape they take uh, from here on out, we will, uh, still support you and I wish we could let you use it for food, but that's not our role. I would say yeah. you could, but unfortunately that's, okay, Lisa. that's the feds, yeah. but I have to say they are very well done and I um, have enjoyed the ones that I attended. Thank you for your support, Lisa. We, I was going to say that and, and after this morning's session with the students, the first lunch and learn that Tammy and I had with the student panel, oh my goodness. They, those are really our favorites. And we have at least one or two of those, sometimes two every year with the student panels. Yes. There was, there was another uh, thing that I remember a little bit. You had a nice co coalition. You know, you already have a really good, strong campus coalition, but you have a good partnership with a professor on campus who takes. Um, is any uh, humanities professor or something? I can't remember. We have a uh, relationship with Dr. Ever well, we have Jane as our top person. Right, right, um, right. As right. you know. Yeah, but, but there's um, a, when they came to the students, you had somebody bring the student, like a counseling professor or something that had students that would come with him. He's like your confederate out in the, out in the trenches. I met him a couple times. Who was it? Was it Evan Peralt? It might no. have been Evan. Yeah, I think it was probably Evan. Yeah, I'm evaluator. guessing it was. In the Department of Communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. That yeah, was it. Yeah. But it's yeah, I think it's helpful projects, to have. Right. Yeah. Um, Tammy talked some about challenges, and, you know, there are many, as we know. So uh, do either. Uh, Catherine or April, do you want to talk about any challenges you have had in implementing your programming, not necessarily during COVID, but just in general? I can go. Um, I think our biggest challenge here is um, engaging with students who are already feeling overcommitted. Um, we have a small campus and we try to provide as normal of a campus um, experience as possible. And with that comes a number of student organizations and um, special interest groups and things that students want to participate in. So, you know, they fit all of that in addition to their athletic schedules into that, you know, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. and then try to have some time for sleep and study. Um, so where do we fit in our programming um, that we can best reach and meet the needs of our students? Um, so I think in-person engagement with students still remains to be our biggest challenge and we have to be creative in what we do. And that's the reason for that late night rack. They come in, they come um, do what they want, they leave, you know, it's informal. Um, but I think that in-person engagement and just getting them to show up, we are happy when we have an event that might have 10 students at it, um, <laughs> um, which, you know, on a campus of our size, think that what you will, but for us, that's what we would consider as success. Um, and then just meeting the needs of the entirety of our student body. Um, feels like sometimes some of them just get, they just get missed. So um, hearing their feedback, giving them the ability to provide that feedback, whether it be through surveys, uh, focus groups, anything of that nature. Um, so that's probably our, our biggest challenges outside of, of COVID. Okay, thanks for sharing that. What are any, any challenges you've experienced, April? I would echo almost verbatim the things that Catherine just shared. Um, we have a small campus too. And so thinking about what, what dictates a success in terms of attendance, 
um, probably has a relatively low threshold. Um, and so for us, it, it's, it's thinking outside the box in terms of kinds of events that we offer. So I, at one of our monthly check-ins, um, I had shared some things that we were planning to do for um, kind, of, kind of COVID friendly ideas. Um, and so recently we just had our pumpkin smash um, and we had 52 students attend, which for us feels um, phenomenal um, to think about that many students coming to an event in the middle of a pandemic um, and trying to do everything that we can to, to uphold the, the guidelines that we have set forth. Um, the, the funny thing for us and kind of the ironic thing, which, which is its own challenge, is that we, we are working around all of those obstacles, um, trying to, when I, when I pull up the activity calendar and try to find an opening um, for when we can schedule something, it does become a bit of a dance um, around our, our activities council and other clubs. Um, and fortunately, we, we now have a centralized location where we track all of that. We, we didn't used to have that, and so that was an even bigger challenge. Um, but trying not to overlap on other activities or events. And at the same time, we have students complaining about having nothing to do. <laughs> um, and so that can, feel, um, that can feel very frustrating that when I look at the, the calendar, there, there is something happening um, nearly every day. Um, and certainly on the weekends, we try to, we try to offer things. Um, and I think, as Catherine said, trying to find things that meet the needs of the largest percentage of students while knowing that you're missing some. Um, and then thinking about how do we engage those students who, um, I think, um, because I'm, I'm a counselor on campus also, anxiety is our number one need that students express. Um, and that, that's been true for a long time. Um, that those students who struggle um, to engage um, socially, to connect, um, it's difficult to, to think about activities that will draw them in. Um, and meet their needs. And COVID only complicates all of that for us. Thanks for sharing that. So, um, I don't, I'm not sure what else we wanna share, Lisa. Um, I think, I think we've covered it all. I really appreciate your, uh, brief reports. I know it's hard to condense everything you've done into a 15 minute presentation, but um, hopefully people have gained some information about what they might be able to implement on their campus, either programs or program strategies, and then maybe some challenges. Do not forget to complete the poll. I put the link into uh, the chat box. So please fill that out so we can have a record of um, your participation as well as information to give our funders. Uh, you are free to go to lunch when you complete that poll and um, we will see you back at 1245. Thanks everybody. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we can have this um, to view later and we can have people on record, right? Representative Smoltz? We operate that way, it's a good thing. It is a good thing. We have about two more minutes before, uh, two more minutes before the other legislators come in to join us. Um, I will say I invited, you will not see no women on this panel, but I did invite when I uh, had invited Representative Austin to come, um, but she is the chair of the Legislative Continuity Committee, which meets soon. And um, you saw that when I was showing you the website. And so she was not able to be here, unfortunately. Um, so I was not excluding anyone. They just didn't work in their schedules, unfortunately, today.
check with Eric to see. Um, as we talked about earlier, if you do have questions, you, uh, Eric will be monitoring the chat box. You can also uh, just unmute yourself and ask questions. I don't think the legislators will mind that. I think uh, uh, Senator Alton may be a few minutes late. But we will go ahead and start while we're waiting for Senator Alting and Senator Taylor to join us. Um, Representative Smaltz is here and on time as he always is at the State House. He's a very conscientious legislator. Uh, so welcome Representative Smaltz. Um, we are happy to have you here. This will Thank probably you. still be a spirited discussion, even though you cannot see our faces for the most part. Um, as with last year, these uh, everyone joining us today works on uh, college campus for the most part in student wellness or prevention. So as you can imagine, alcohol and marijuana issues are very important to this group. Um, but do you wanna start by introducing yourself and um, talking about your committee? Sure. My name is Ben Smoltz. I represent District 52. That's Northeast Indiana, uh, nearly to Michigan and right on the Ohio line. I am the chairman of public policy. So as of importance to this group is all alcohol bills that touch 7.1 come to me. I regularly work with the ATC on uh, trying to improve, understand, or clarify code and work with Mrs. Hutchinson on a a uh, pretty regular basis through session talking about how alcohol laws impact mental health and public safety um, and minors. Did you say how long you have been a legislator? I didn't. I've been there eight years. I was elected in 2012 and I started in 2013. I've been chairman of public policy for the last four years. Great, and I see we have Senator Alting joining us. Hi, Senator Alting. Hello, uh, good afternoon. We thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Would you like to introduce yourself and um, tell us about your role as public policy chair? Well, I'm State Senator Ron Alting from Lafayette, Indiana. And um, I represent District 22, which is basically Tippecanoe County. Um, <laughs> I've been chairman of public policy committee in the Senate, seems like forever. <laughs> uh, with the retirement of Jim Merritt, I'm number one in seniority now in the Indiana Republican Senate, so it tells you how old I'm getting. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to work with you over the years, and I think some of the people joining us today have also worked with you on things, or you are their legislator, so thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Um, We'll get started uh, while we wait for uh, Senator Taylor to join us, but the big question on my mind as a lobbyist, and I'm sure on the minds of everyone else, is how is COVID going to impact the 2021 legislative session um, in terms of just how you will get your business done? And then how will the public be able to be involved since I imagine there'll be some restrictions around it? Senator Alting, we'll start with you. Well, what I have been told is, um, and again, as the numbers continue to come in, everything's changing, and it could be changing as, as we're having this discussion. But one of the things I know that the Senate is concentrating on as well as the House is transparency. Uh, the public will be guaranteed to have a voice, as they always uh, do, but it may be done just differently. I think what we're looking at in committees uh, in, in doing our committees, much like we're doing right now, is that the only people that would be allowed in a committee room with social distancing would be uh, the Senate members of the committee. There'd be a separate room for lobbyists and or 
the public to go to with social distancing that they will go in and uh, uh, and, and, and talk into technology and then it will come on the screen in the committee room and we'll conduct business like that. So um, that's what I've been told. But the one, the number one concern is safety. And then second is transparency and making sure that everyone still has a voice. And uh, I, that's what I've been told of, of uh, how we're looking to conduct this year's, but you know, make no uh, mistake. It's, it's going to be difficult. I mean, uh, anytime you get that many people uh, in, um, you've got great challenges. I mean, the Constitution says the only thing we've got to do this session is the budget. And then on top of that, of course, we got redistricting. So um, I think we got great challenges ahead of us, uh, like, like most citizens do in Indiana with the COVID. And uh, we just want to make sure that we're doing it right and being safe in doing so. Yeah, definitely. Um, and like you said, who knows, the numbers change literally on a daily basis. So we don't know what it's going to look like even for organization day next week. Uh, Representative Smaltz, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. I toured the facility in Government Center South uh, earlier this week. I looked at what the House chamber is going to look like, uh, what the committee rooms are going to look like. Uh, of course, we're going to be televised when we're officially doing business, whether it's committee or um, on the floor. Uh, I think there's going to be uh, some separation of committee members and members of the public. So some of that may be electronic, similar to what's, what's going on now. And that's going to depend a lot on how Indiana progresses through, through COVID as we start going into the holiday season. Um, you know, families start coming together. There's lots of traveling. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in January, but the, the important piece is planning for different scenarios and the continuity committee between the House and the Senate uh, have done really good work on to be better to handle whatever situation uh, that we have. I think it's going to be different. Uh, I think the, um, uh, the public is going to have access, but as Senator Alting mentioned, I think it may just may appear a little different and we're going to have to work through it together uh, to make sure that their voice is heard and, and their concerns are heard as we work on various pieces of legislation. And as we think ahead to uh, next week, I don't know if uh, most people are familiar with the term organization day, but uh, Senator Alting, do you want to tell us what organization day is? I believe it's the 17th which is the next week. You want to tell us what it is and what is the purpose of Organization Day? Well, several pur purposes, but one of the main one is swearing in the office to new elected officials. And I know we've given instructions out in the Senate to really limit in the past with, you know, we've had grandpa and grandma and everyone come and this and that. And this, this year, I know we're kind of limiting that to your spouse only. But uh, the swearing in is a very proud moment for those people that's worked hard and that got the, the constituents' trust in being elected and being there and being sworn in. So, uh, uh, you know, that, that's basically the highlight of what, in my opinion, of Organization Day is. Okay. Representative Smoltz, anything to add to that? Sure. I think um, in addition to Senator Altings mentioned, our, our speaker... Uh, lays out what our session agenda is going to be, what our top priorities are, uh, and starts laying the groundwork for the direction that we're going to go on uh, top end issues. Uh, what what some of those some of the back work has done. I'll be interested to see it'll be his first organization day speech. Uh, traditionally, the speaker of the house speaks on org day and the uh, minority leader speaks on the first day of session. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how it all comes together. And, uh, you know, I know certainly what some of my priorities are and uh, looking forward to working with the team and working with the Senate to get done what's right the best we can. Okay. Um, you gave me a pretty good segue there, Representative Smaltz, but this is, is a budget year. Um, the only thing constitutionally you have to do is pass a budget. But um, what do you see as the most important issue uh, in the session concerning the budget? Where do you think um, the focus will be? And uh, we'll start with you, Senator Alting. 
Well, since over 50% of the budget's education, I think a lot of the emphasis will be there. But the great challenge is, is during this COVID with the downs, if you will, of the income to the state is in the really the prediction of what in the world's going to happen in the future with the COVID uh, is try to try to uh, carve out a two-year budget and that's not only going to be a challenge in Indiana but in all of our states in this great country as we sat down and do this. We're very very fortunate in Indiana to have strong reserves uh, so like what has happened this past uh, COVID attack since March if you will uh, we've be able to get through it quite quite easily uh, financially, but uh, we may have some dark days coming ahead. So, uh, you know, it's really paying attention to statistics and what's happening and, and try to figure out uh, I think we might have uh, lost you, Senator uh, All right, I think uh, Senator Alting, if you can hear us, we might have lost you there for a minute. Um, Representative Smaltz, what do you think you will be focusing on in your caucus in terms of the budget? I think the, we're, we're gonna have to see where we are with the available funds. Uh, one thing that I've always been grateful for in our caucus is a responsible use of money available to us, um, making sure that we have enough money held back for that rainy day, which has arrived. Uh, we do it, you know, and as I plan for my business and I plan for uh, at my home, we keep money back in reserve. So I think it's going to be very important to maintain that uh, funding for the future. Uh, we don't know where we're going to be uh, exactly. We didn't have a, a fall forecast. We will have one in December. So we should have an idea of uh, what our revenues are. Uh, of our, our and I think of one number that I've been watching is um, the alcohol tax seems to be ticking up some as people are stuck home uh, and and doing that which is you know healthy uh, unhealthy to go up the amounts that I've seen so I think it's be important to watch that uh, watch that tax as it comes in I think we're going to focus on law enforcement. We have said for several months that we are going to support our law enforcement, uh, uh, expand their training at their, their academy. We're going to uh, do some work and try to provide them with body cameras. It seems as though a lot of the videos that we see, I see the cameras as protecting them. Uh, a lot of the videos that we see on YouTube or Facebook are the last eight or 10 or 12 seconds of you know, 40 minutes of interaction. So I think it's for the police to be able to tell their story. It's very important on some of that. Uh, so I think those are just a couple of things that in the budget that are going to be very important to us. Okay, thank you. And we'll get back to the alcohol tax in a little bit. But um, speaking of alcohol, both of you are chairs of the public policy committees where the alcohol issues go. Um, and the other issues as well, tobacco and, and other issues like that. Um, so you, you've been working on alcohol issues, well, Senator Alting has for longer than you have, Representative Smaltz, but you've put in your time as well. We know that alcohol use has increased among adults and, and likely teens uh, during the pandemic. And we know that alcohol regulation is always a very popular topic during session. Uh, the governor, uh, had some executive orders that loosen some of the restrictions on alcohol and allow things like curbside delivery and cocktails to go. Um, are these regulations going to be considered during the next session to be made permanent? And um, if so, what safeguards would be put in place, particularly, particularly if we have data showing that alcohol use has increased greatly in our state? Um, how will you weigh those two things out. Uh, Senator Alting, would you like to start? Well, I think, yeah, I think you've experienced curbside is a top priority for some of the big box people. And uh, the safeguards will be uh, 
probably will put it under a microscope on what his, how it has worked over these last uh, three or four months uh, and what's worked and what's not worked. But uh, I think you see uh, legislation offered on a lot of what's been uh, the governor has, uh, has looked at and accepted. And the curbside will be one that for sure uh, that will probably be visited. Okay. Representative Smaltz. Yeah, I think the, the executive orders will stay in place until the, the governor ends them, or obviously the General Assembly um, intervenes. Curbside has been a, a much discussed topic. Delivery of alcohol has been much discussed. And I think it's going to really matter how COVID-19 and the pandemic is handled in Indiana. Is there a resurgence? Is there a... a do we start going backwards to keeping people at home um, in situations where restaurants, um, you know, small breweries are having trouble making? That's the reason those executive orders were put in place to give permittees uh, abilities they did not have with their specific permit type. So restaurants were able to deliver or bring out to the to somebody's car and the same thing with, with some other permittees. So it's gonna depend on what happens as we go forward because the, the restaurant industry in the state of Indiana is very important. It employs tens of thousands of people. Uh, billions of dollars have been invested in the infrastructure and we are going to have to very carefully uh, ensure that our friends in the restaurant industry that all of us visit are with us on the other side of this pandemic when it, and I do believe it will eventually come to a close. Well, I certainly hope you're right, sooner rather than later. So as you know, we recently had a presidential election and um, eight additional states voted to legalize or decriminalize marijuana in some fashion. Some it's recreational, for some it's medical. Um, please talk about where you think Indiana is with this issue um, and how you might approach um, bills that have to do with decriminalizing or legalizing marijuana. And then I'll have a follow-up to the question. Um, Senator Alting, we'll start with you. Well, let me just say probably the most important election uh, re regarding marijuana was our governor's election. He got elected for another four-year term and he's adamantly against it and said that he would veto any bill that came before him uh, pertaining to legalization of marijuana. So uh, I find him to be a governor of his word, so I would think it's almost a moot subject uh, unless uh, people uh, with scientific evidence can perhaps persuade him to take a look at the uh, medical marijuana sign, side of it and see how it can be structured with safety zones in it that can still help those individuals that are really uh, needing some kind of release uh, for their ailment whether it be fighting cancer, or et cetera, et cetera, that they have found uh, marijuana to be, you know, a big benefit uh, to them. So, but in terms of just all out uh, marijuana, I don't think you're going to see that in the next four years. Okay. Representative Smoltz. Sure. I think the, the, the ultimate outcome of the presidential election may weigh in heavily as well. Uh, I've heard the governor, he has said that uh, marijuana is a schedule one drug by the federal government. And uh, my feel from what he has said, as long as that is the case, uh, he is not uh, prepared, ready or willing to uh, talk about legalizing marijuana. Uh, I think that uh, Indiana is not a referendum state. So the, the decisions are gonna be up to your general assembly to make. Uh, I think oftentimes referenda uh, questions are, uh, they don't have a positive outcome. I've, I've seen some loosening of drug laws in states that I think are very extreme. And I often wonder, do I personally think uh, 100 miles an hour out on I-69 is, uh, is good as a driver? Well, sure, maybe, but is it good for public safety? And we really have to consider that uh, as legislators, is it, is it something that the people of Indiana want or and how does that affect public health and public safety? So uh, we'll see what bills 
come forward, but we'll be very mindful of uh, the presidential outcome and very mindful of the position of our governor and of the, the House, you know, uh, the Speaker of the House as well. Thank you, and you have given me yet another good segue. So when both of you are considering, you know, which bills you're gonna hear in your committee, and we know you have many bills that people want you to hear in your committee, how do you make the decision which bills to hear? And then how do you prioritize those bills once they come to your committee? Because, you know, the session is finite, the long session, you have a little more time, but particularly in a short ses session, everything is condensed. So how do you choose the bills and then how do you prioritize those? Uh, Senator Alt. Well, I've never uh, hit my philosophy, which is best government is less government. So uh, I normally hear, hear very few bills. Uh, and the prior, priority of the bills being heard is the priority of change a little bit with the COVID as my colleague uh, Representative Small said. So that, that might change a little bit adapting to uh, what we have to keep some businesses open. Uh, however, uh, always the base on prioritizing which bills you hear is good public policy. What is good public policy for the immediate future, but more important, what's good public policy uh, for years down, uh, down the line to think of long term and how it's going to have an effect uh, on really the whole alcohol industry. So, um, uh, but, uh, y y you know, it, it always comes down to uh, good public policy, what makes sense, what's safety, um, and, and you're, you know, you're working with a substance that uh, that kills people. So, you know, you got to be very sensitive to that. Um, so I, I've, I like Representative Smaltz, I think both of us are, we agree that we're kind of on the conservative side of, of alcohol, which we should be it, it, in doing so. And we've seen deaths go down compared to when I came in 14 years ago uh, on traffic fatalities and some other things. So uh, we just got to be very careful on what we do when we discuss alcohol and what bills to hear in alcohol. Sure, thank you. Representative Smoltz, how do you prioritize the bills that come to your committee and how do you decide what to hear or not hear? So as it relates to alcohol, I was uh, very pleased last year that we did not have any alcohol legislation. I'm a firm believer that um, alcohol legislation is uh, not an emergency in most instances and shouldn't be treated as such in an emergency session. Uh, it also gives the, the players um, in the industry as well as the community as a whole uh, 24 months of rules that they can uh, work with and, and aren't changing uh, those changing rules that can be very helpful. Things happening and alcohol that we may not like just because of the speed of, of, of how that legislation works. But I, when I'm looking at alcohol, I look very carefully at 7.1 itself. That's the guide. It tells us very clearly what the priority is when it comes to alcohol. And it's the very first thing the general purposes. Uh, and it is in this order it is to protect the economic health, peace, and morals of people in the state of Indiana in that order. So when I am reviewing um, the, the bills that come to me until those words are changed, it is in that priority. And we move forward on bills uh, uh, as we feel apply to those particular pieces of 7.1. And both of you obviously hear bills and hear some, some of your bills have many, many people testifying. So in those instances, um, when you're hearing a bill that might be controversial or, you know, could change the way the landscape of alcohol, how it's sold, um, what do you want to hear when people are providing testimony to you that is important um, in your decision making? What kind of information or data do you want to hear, Senator Alting, when people are testifying in your committee? Well, I think first and foremost, an honest testimony. I think, you know, Representative Smaltz and myself, we, 
we know the alcohol industry pretty well, as well as probably any chairman in any state. So, you know, we, we can sense real quick when someone is coming in with a special interest testimony and a special interest only uh, versus coming in uh, with good public policy and a testimony. We also have available at our fingertips on policies that have worked or not worked in other states. Uh, so we can study and take a look on, on perhaps how that testimony or how that particular law is working or not working in other states. So, um, uh, but it, it comes down to what our mom and dad uh, taught us when we were small, and that is honest testimony. Good, good point. And, and I would hope you would say that I've always provided honest testimony in your committee, even though you have. Always agree. You have. <laughs> that is my first and foremost, too, when I'm doing my research. You know, I always make sure my facts are straight. If I don't know something you ask me, I'm not going to make something up and give you an answer that's not true. I know better than that. Uh, Representative Smoltz, anything you want to add to that? I think it'd be fair to say on that topic that Lisa is uh, at the state house. She's working hard. She provides data. Uh, the data is trustworthy. Uh, her testimony is concise and to the point. And, and I would say that that would be important for anybody testifying is to be concise, be to the point. Now, Senator Alting and I live in 7.1. I mean, we're in it all the time. But not all committee members and certainly not all members of the House have the same time ability to focus on that. So being able to explain to the members very quickly, very concisely what it is the, the problem is um, and what the solution is. And what I like as a, as a representative, as a chairman, as a business owner is if you have a problem and you want to tell me about your problem, accompany that conversation with the solution. What do you think solves the problem that you have brought to us? And let us evaluate that and then share it out to our, uh, our committee. Great. So both of you know, one of the issues I've been working on for a decade now is to increase the alcohol tax. Um, obviously, it's not an extremely popular notion since it hasn't happened yet, but uh, just a little background for people. Our alcohol tax has not been increased since 1981. Um, I believe it's probably the only tax in our state that hasn't been increased since 1981. Um, but we know data tells us, um, and I know I've shared all this data with both of you, that an increase in the alcohol tax, much like the tobacco tax, will reduce youth consumption as well as adult high-risk consumption of alcohol. So, um, you know, my question would be, why hasn't an alcohol tax been considered yet? And I know it would not come to either of your committees. It, it obviously would go to Ways and Means or um, appropriations. But um, what are your thoughts on an alcohol tax and why it has not been considered up until this point? I mean, with the increase of use, we know we're going to need and we already need more money for prevention and treatment. So, um, you know, with, with an increase in COVID use, we're likely to see even a, a greater need for services and need funding for that. So what are your thoughts on increasing the alcohol tax and um, what do you think the chances might be this year of that bill getting traction? And we'll start with you, Senator Alting. Well, I think because what we have just been through and what we are probably gonna go through, that it would be something that legislators will take a strong look at uh, this coming session. Um, I think the challenge has been in the past is that uh, pe people in the, in the Republican uh, caucus generally do not like raising taxes, period, of any sort, but have been known to do so uh, in the past. So one of the challenges with, with the, a tax increase, that, that usually is a decision that the caucus will make. Uh, on whether we're going to hear it and where we stand together on it. So uh, it's really not, at least on our side, always a chairman's uh, choice on whether I'm going to hear it or not, but it's something that's discussed as a caucus at whole. And uh, before they put the members through a vote on that, is this something that we have a chance getting through? And also, is it something that our colleagues, and I'm sure they feel the same way, is it something that 
they would consider hearing in the House of Representatives, and they probably in the House thinks the same uh, on the Senate, although most of those bills that uh, increase starts uh, in the House of Representatives that uh, increases revenues. So, um, uh, but you mentioned uh, these are different times and great challenges. So uh, it might get some traction uh, this session. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, Representative Smaltz, what do you have to add? I agree with you. Uh, these aren't going to come to either Chairman Alting or I. They're going to go through ways and means on on our side and and their tax and fiscal on uh, the Senate side. It's a decision that we are going to make together, uh, and it'll be a, it'll be a difficult decision. I think some of the the things we're really going to have to consider is the you know be situationally aware of um, restaurants in particular increasing what may be their their cost downstream um, in a time that they may well experience additional struggles that uh, supersede and are, are bigger than what they have in the past. So uh, it'll be a group decision. It'll be a group conversation. Uh, there'll be some interesting debate on it if it makes it that far to the to the floor. But, you know, the, the wait and see attitude on tax increases with and especially not having seen what the budget's gonna look like, it'd be very difficult to make a decision today. Okay, well, you know, you'll hear from me. <laughs> so um, <laughs> even though it's not gonna be in your committee, you know, you'll hear from me anyway, um, since that is something I obviously strongly support. But um, so, you know, we're thinking about the session and how strange and different it's gonna be. Um, next session in 2021. Uh, first of all, the session starts in January. I don't remember the exact date. Do you, one of you remember? <laughs> it's early January. Um, first so June. considering first Tuesday in January. First Tuesday, the first okay. full week. Is that right? Uh, I think so. So considering that and all the challenges that are likely to you know, be around next session. Um, first of all, what advice do you give people? I mean, I walk them through the ed legislative website, IGA.gov before you came on to show them how to navigate, to find your committees and how to watch things online and how to find their own legislator. Um, what words of wisdom or advice can you give to people who might be new to the legislative process? Maybe they don't even know who their legislator is. Um, what would you uh, tell them to do um, to get involved or to get to know their legislator, uh, Senator Alting? Well, I, it, it, that's a good question, but an easy one to answer, and that is simply get involved. I mean, we work for the people. The people don't work for us. I have, you know, approximately 175,000 people that I work for, plus another add-on close to 7 million in the state of Indiana. So it's our jobs as elected officials and responsibilities to listen and to meet with our constituents. So there's a big difference between state government and what you shouldn't have a contact of, of your representatives and works in Indiana, both in the House and the Senate. And send them an email, uh, uh, send them uh, updates on your feelings on different topics. Uh, Representative Smaltz is, is absolutely correct. Everything is taped. You can see it in the safety of your living room or office, all the committee meetings, a session, uh, all the session hearings that you'll be able to see. Uh, so uh, feel free to shoot your uh an email is the best way uh, to your uh, House members and Senate members expressing your views and, and tell them I, I, I look forward receiving your uh, feedback and answers to some questions. Sure. I think we lost him again for a second, but. Um... Or what do you think of my feelings on this particular? But get involved uh, when it works, and most of the time in the world. So I, I encourage for the citizens to get involved. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what would you like to add about that, Representative Smoltz? I'd say consistency in your message. When you're ready and you, you have decided as a group um, 
what policy initiatives that you're interested in that you are clear and concise, uh, that same message, it, it's much easier to move if it is clear and concise among the entire body, the, the Republicans, Democrats, General Assembly uh, as a whole. The second thing I would say is that uh, building relationships, not just when you need something, but to build it on a consistent uh, session by session, monthly basis. Uh, I, I will tell you that a, a very well-organized group uh, is the Indiana Farm Bureau, uh, bringing members from our constituencies to see us several times through the, uh, the legislative process to be with us because it's important for them to tell us what their opinions are, which help us formulate what our opinions are, or, or if we have some difference of, of opinion, why, uh, I think it's important to uh, pay attention to how we treat each other when we agree as, as much as when we disagree and try to get to a point where uh, we keep moving the, towards the goal, whatever that may be and whatever policy initiative that is. Can both of you talk about, you mentioned relationships, which I have found in my work as a lobbyist is very important, even when you don't agree with a legislator necessarily, they don't agree with you, it's important to have that personal relationship. So talk about the importance of building that outside of session, because I always tell communities with, if you wait to get to know your legislator during session, it's probably not gonna happen because they're too busy. So how can, your constituents or uh, other um, people connect with their legislators when session is not in? Senator Alting? Well, th that's a good question also. And, and that is, uh, it's all about relationships. Uh, you can email them, ask them, do you have time to, to meet me for a cup of coffee or, or, or a Coke? Uh, that I'd like to get an opportunity to meet you uh, at a location that you can choose. Uh, something casual, something, uh, and it's like uh, Representative Small says, it don't even have to be about legislation. It's just about, we get emails all the time from people just wanting to meet us, just wanting to pick our minds on what's your philosophy of government? What, it's, it's a lot of questions like you just said, uh, Lisa, that you've presented to us. You know, what's your philosophy? What do you base a good bill on, et cetera, et cetera. And, and usually in the off session through the summer months, is a wonderful time to contact your legislator and get to know them a little bit. So when session does begin and you get an email from uh, Marla Smith, you put a picture in the face to Marla Smith and that relationship all of a sudden becomes uh, something very special to a legislator. Yeah. Uh, uh, Representative Smalls, do you have anything to add? It's important to know what the, the cadence and the pace of a, a legislative session is going to be. And that is going to be difficult this year. In the prior sessions, it's very easy to predict uh, when the session, when we're in, uh, when we're out. Uh, I think the, the House has discussed Monday afternoon and going home Thursday evening. So that means legislators are typically home on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So for me, as a, as a business owner, Fridays are work days for me, but Saturdays are my home policy days. So if somebody has a policy issue, I normally try and schedule them for Saturday uh, and then, you know, Sunday family and then back to work on Monday. So as, as long as you know uh, when the most uh, accessible time for a legislator is, and it works out to be an accessible time for you, then I would take advantage of those those Saturdays or Friday evenings, uh, Monday mornings before people come in to communicate with them face-to-face. Face-to-face is, is the best relationship building tool there is. Uh, letters are always nice. Form letters, um, mm -hmm. less effective, but uh, certainly, you know, I, I can tell you that when mail comes to me for whatever reason over the past eight years, uh, cards are always on top. I've never dictated that or asked for it but it seems as though the mailroom takes uh, particular note of, of people who have taken particular note of how they communicate and put them on top. It just, it's, an, it's an anomaly that I've never been able to figure out other than that, but that is how the mail comes. And so, you know, what I appreciate about both of you is that you're accessible to everyone, not just lobbyists. I mean, I am a lobbyist, I work for a nonprofit, but 
you're as accessible to me as you are to the big lobbyists who work for the big law firms, even though I don't take you out to steak dinners and I don't take you to play golf. Um, so I think it's important for people on this call to realize that you are accessible. You don't have to be a lobbyist. You don't have to take anybody anywhere. You can uh, still you know, build a relationship with your legislator. So I appreciate that about both of you. I can tell you that that means a great deal. I don't do a lot of the of a very, very little of the going out sort of thing, which I think will be enormously curtailed for the folks that do uh, in this upcoming session. But uh, I think the vast majority of the members of the General Assembly are kind of policy wonks just like I am and want to look at what the right thing to do is and how to get there. And you're right, oftentimes we have to filter out the loud drum of, of big industry for what really is the right thing to do. But uh, a good legislator is able to do that. Yeah, my, and in my situation is a little different too, that I'm very blessed that uh, I represent the community I was born and raised in. So, I've, you know, I've, I've been in my community and I always tell my legislative assistant, I live in my community. I do the grocery shopping. I go to the bank. I go to the high school by the night. Uh, I'm out and about. So it's so wonderful to have people walk over to me and introduce themselves and, and start a relationship uh, just kind of unannounced, unexpectedly. And uh, it, it's just quite an honor, uh, as it is to all of us to be elected. But it's kind of neat when, when you, your 86-year-old first grade teacher walks up to you and says, hi, Ronnie. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping my eye on you, <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's, it's, it's really a privilege. It, it really is. I had a very similar to that. I had a 95 year old constituent was having a terrible time trying to get her driver's license, uh, ran into roadblocks, was able to reach out to me and we were able to help her through that almost on her birthday, her 95th birthday. Uh, hopefully she passed the test, but <laughs> certainly were able to remove some of those hurdles, but you know, being accessible, I also represent a community that I've lived in since I was uh, three, three years old. I've been here my entire life. Uh, so it, it really is uh, a lot of fun and interacting face-to-face, -face, as I mentioned before, is, is uh, one of the best parts. Great, thanks. We're gonna uh, open it up to questions now. And uh, the first question we have is about redistricting. Um, can you explain the process of redistricting and how those decisions are made? And then what changes should we anticipate as citizens of Indiana? Uh, Senator Alting, I'll let you start. Well, I might have a strange uh, answer to that, but it's the honest answer. And that is, I've kept out of redistricting. I don't meet with the chairman of it. I don't meet with the committees of it. I don't ask anything of it. I just accept uh, whatever they give to me because I still believe that it's about the candidate that's running. Now, has that cost me in the percentages <laughs> of Republicans in my district? You darn right it has. But um, uh, no one can ever that I put any heat or pressure in my section uh, because I serve in that. And I'm not saying that that happens or it takes place, but it, it's just a philosophy that I've always had and I keep away from. And, um, you know, whatever they give me, they give me. So I think that uh, it, it is a, a difficult process. I don't know it as well as I should because I don't uh, want to be involved in that. They've got committees that does that and the chairman that does that and uh, uh, I let them do what they do best. Uh, Representative Smaltz, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. So I think it's, it's um, you know, it's a numbers thing, obviously. Uh, the census, uh, if uh, President Trump was able to or is able to maintain the office, the, the census is mostly done and remains to go into you know, whatever algorithm or final touches they need to put on it. If um, Biden is the president-elect or is, is going to be in that office, uh, I don't think it would be under that uh, they would take a different numbers and delay them. So I feel as though if President Trump is reelected, those numbers will come to us much more quickly. I, I have a goal 
would like to see those districts drawn this year. Uh, if we don't get it done this year, uh, then we're drawing it in a short session when people are trying to set up precincts and elections and who are my constituents, uh, I think it becomes uh, very difficult. I think it's gonna be, you know, I would imagine that we're gonna go from about 63,000 people in our district to maybe 65 to 67,000 people in the district. And for a district like mine, I'm not sure where I go. I mean, I've got um, Ohio on one side. If I go north, then I am, you know, pushing um, another member into his district into Michigan. And then where does he go? Then he goes west. Uh, so it's, it's, it has to be the same number uh, across the state. So I'm really interested to see how that develops um, and how those maps uh, come together. I will be watching them because I'm interested to see uh, what the process is and, and how that how that is accomplished. You know, we do it every 10 years. So it's, uh, it's an unusual occurrence that I'm interested to see uh, finish up. So this is a question. Um, what made you decide to get into politics and run for a state office? We know it's not all glamour. You get a lot of hate mail, I'm sure, uh, on something. So why sign up for that kind of abuse? Long hours, long drives, you know, you both drive in, um, you might stay there during session, but why did you decide it was important that you uh, run for election for this office, Senator Alting? Well, my parents taught me as a small boy to be a giver. I was born and raised in a family of faith. I'm a man of faith. And I think uh, it's a responsibility and also uh, just a wonderful trait to be a giver in life and not a taker. We don't have a shortage uh, of, of takers in life, but we have a shortage of givers. And there's nothing more important uh, than constituent services. We've been talking about bills and, and laws, but really the most important job that I see that I have is constituent services. It's like Representative Small said on the lady that called him, we get calls of people in drier need. And usually when they call their, their representative or state senator, we're the last. I mean, they are, in, they are in drier need. We are it. They are in quicksand up to their neck and they need our help. And it's just a, a great uh, honor to be able to help 7 million people out there, not only with good public policy on laws, uh, but, but, but also just to help them in their everyday life. I mean, during this COVID experience, you know, I've had, I've had so many examples. Uh, I had a 38 year old uh, man that was dying of cancer in the hospital and, and, and he had just hours to live and his mother wanted to see him before he passed and the hospital wouldn't get him in. So it, with some phone calls, it was allowed for the mother to see her son before he passed about four hours after they got to see each other. Uh, same way in the nursing homes with the COVID happening. I mean, there's, I can give you some incredible experiences, which, which uh, is very rewarding to me on helping people. It's all about helping people, not helping Republicans, not helping Democrats, not helping independents, but helping people. You know, the YMCA used to have the slogan, it's about people helping people. It's Hoosiers helping Hoosiers. That has always been my philosophy. I've never asked what party affiliation you're in, but more so based on my faith, I'm here to help you. I just have a new LA, a legislative assistant coming in, and he asked me, what's your number one priority, Senator? And I said, it's constituent services. It's helping people. That's what we need to focus on. Thank you. And Representative Smaltz, what about you? What what made you decide to run for elected office? I kind of have an interesting story about that. Uh, you know, my parents were very involved in the community. My dad was in the Navy. Uh, he volunteered his time here locally. My mom was a public school teacher and uh, helped lots of kids. It, she's been, uh, she was a teacher for 32 years and she's been out now um, 15 or 18 years. And I still have grown men and women come up to me and tell me what an impact she had um, on their life helping them. He was especially good with troubled kids. Uh, 
and helping them. So I grew up in, in that environment. But what brought me to the state house was I was doing local public service um, in DeKalb County. I was on the county council. I was volunteering. Um, and you know, the interesting part of my story was I wasn't supposed to run. I wasn't ready to run. I always wanted to run when the time was right, but I was uh, very busy at my business. My dad had uh, passed not all that long before that, and he was the president of our company. Uh, my kids were both in high school. Uh, my daughter was a cheerleader. My son was a, a basketball player. And I'll tell you, one of the greatest parental moments is when your daughter is a varsity cheerleader and your son is a varsity basketball player because you get a two for event. You only have to go to one event to cover two kids. So I was really <laughs> <laughs> all those things so as part of a, a small group um we knew that uh dave yard was going to run for senate we knew this district 52 was going to be open and we were trying to find somebody who who could fill that seat and it always seemed like something would come up we'd find a person and, and then they didn't want to or the retirement you know they're already serving in the police and, and had trouble with the uh retirement and finally we had one candidate we thought okay, we're good. This, this person is just a decent human being, is going to do a great job, um, electable candidate, you know, has the energy. And I was with my son. I was really excited about it. And I was talking to him. We were in a car together. And I got a phone call. It was the candidate. Was like, I just can't do it. And I got off the phone and I was, I was really upset. I was, I was pretty upset, I got to tell you. And my son said, when are you going to realize that you're supposed to run? <laughs> and, you know, we, we talked about it. We had a family meeting and said, it's going to be tough. Uh, I'm going to have to come home night. So my first two years, I was home almost every night. And it's a two and a half hour drive for me just so I could catch, you know, an event that, that my kids were in. And so it, just it, me, so it just kind of happened for me in a natural way. Uh, it wasn't a long-term plan. It, someday I would have liked to have done it. But, but right then was a little tough. So that's kind of my story, how I ended up being there. And, and, and Senator, all things right. It's about constituent services. And, and you'd mentioned people call and yell. And I've been in customer service and retail most of my life. And you just have to be able to filter through the anger or the sadness or just the lack of any hope for really what is the issue. And you can't let that say, well, they're mad at me, so I can't help them. You really, there's almost always a kernel of really important information in there. And it's our job to find that. And most often it, it's there if we look. So I like that. I don't like getting yelled at, but I like, <laughs> it. I like to figure out and have that aha moment. It's like, okay, I totally get it now. I see what the problem is. And now I can be, now I can be helpful. And, and I really do enjoy that a lot. Great. And um, so if someone is thinking about coming to talk to you or their own legislator, um, you know, I admit sometimes you guys can be scary, um, you know, especially if you've never been in the state house before, or you've never talked to a legislator, you've never testified in committee. Um, Senator Alting is always very well dressed and, you know, he, he looks like, you know, a, you are afraid sometimes to talk in committee, especially in his committee. It's very august, and and I'm not saying yours isn't Representative Smaltz, but um, for people who are afraid or think, you know, I could never talk to a legislator, I could never testify in committee, you know, I don't know what to say, I would be too afraid. What advice would you have uh, to give someone who wants to testify but is afraid or you know doesn't think they would have the right thing to say, Senator Alting? what would you tell them? You look so nice in your committee. You always have a beautiful suit on. Um, you could look a little, you know, intimidating if someone doesn't know you. Uh, what advice would you give to someone coming to testify in your committee? Oh, the, the same advice I give to everybody when they're forced to make a speech, uh, whether it be a family speech at Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner, and that is just show up and speak from the heart. Always speak from the heart. Don't, you don't have to rehearse. You don't have to make notes, but speak from the heart. The true story is that all of us sitting up there in the committee are ordinary people. We're ordinary people trying to perform extraordinary uh, tasks. And I've, I've always said that. I open up every committee meeting saying, welcome to the people's house, because this is your house. You're testifying in your house. And all of us come from a variety of backgrounds. I come from a, an extremely simple 
uh, background. My parents had eighth grade education. They were hardworking blue collar workers, uh, come from not a whole lot outside of they taught me faith. They taught me to be proud, confident in yourself, try to get an education in your life, work hard, work hard, work hard, and Ronnie, be yourself, be yourself. So thank you for saying I dress nice, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm still the kid, and I say that from South 4th Street in Lafayette, Indiana, which is kind of a poor end of our town. Uh, I'm the kid from South 4th Street. I will always be the, the son of my mother and dad, and I say that proudly. So we're ordinary people, and no matter what you do for a living, if you're listening to this, trust me, you are more than welcome in your house to testify in front of any committee. Don't be scared and talk from your heart. Thank you, that's good advice. I still even get a little intimidated in your committee sometimes and I've been in it for years. Um, Representative Smaltz, the same question to you. you um, your committee meets in the basement, which is intimidating in and of itself because it's in a small room and there are a lot of lobbyists in there. And um, so it can be a little overwhelming. So what advice would you give to someone wanting to come and testify in normal circumstances, of course, uh, in your committee? I would, I would tell that person to ask themselves why I'm here. Why, why did I come here? And you came there because it's an important issue to you. And what you need to be able to do is inform the members of the committee and make it important to them. Uh, use a mix of, of emotion and data and fact to try and weave the story. Tell me a story about why is this important? Um, you know, if you come in and it's all dry data, then and there's no emotion attached to it, that's that's harder for somebody to get their arms around. So tell me why it's important and tell me the story about, you know, you didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to work on this policy initiative. What what brought you there? And uh, share with us how important it is and tell us about how we're affecting people's lives uh, and downstream and how we can make that better because that's what we want to do is you know, in, in all things, leave this place better somehow. Tell us how we do that. And that, I think that really is the, the foundation of any legislation is knowing that at the end of the day and at the end of the session, I have done the right things and we're all a little better for all the efforts that we put into it and all the nights that we're up late and all the, all the research that we've done and we've left this place somewhat better. Uh, I really think that's, that's what gets most of us going and, and, and I would say, just, just tell us, tell us the story. Great advice. And, um, you know, I think like Senator Alting was saying earlier, if you always provide honest testimony and, and representative small, you know, the data that, uh, you like to hear in your committee, um, it doesn't matter if you're a high paid lobbyist. Um, if you, you know, are, telling your story and why you want to be there and why you think an issue is important. And if you do throw in some, some good data, I think, you know, it, it is compelling, even though you might not be a lobbyist paid to do that job. Um, so, you know, I know we've had some of our members come and testify. It was several years ago and when we were talking about keg registration, we had some of our colleges come and testify. And I mean, we were tenacious. Tammy Lowe was part of that contingent contingency and um you know they were tenacious and they uh you know they were so tenacious that um the legislator at the time came to me and said please have your people stop contacting me i don't want to hear from them anymore <laughs> that's when i knew we were successful um and that actually the law you know passed so i would um you know encourage everyone that also, you know, I'm sure the both of you know this, obviously, um, you know, legislation usually doesn't get passed overnight. So what advice would you give people looking, you know, to work on a piece of legislation or come to you with a, a bill um, about, you know, how the process of passing and how it's not an overnight thing? Um, patience sometimes is not my virtue, I have to admit. Um, you know, like working on the alcohol tax for a decade. So what advice would you give people, um, Representative Smaltz about, um, you know, what the real process, process is for passing a bill and how long it might take? 
Well, that's a, that's a really good point. You've got 151 people in the process, 100 in the House, 50 in the Senate and the governor and changing minds overnight is, is uh, difficult and unrealistic. Uh, I would say sometimes when people come, uh, they had come with an oversimplification of the problem or of the situation, which leads them to an overly simpli uh, simplistic solution, which doesn't work and leads to frustration. So I would say, come be realistic, uh, really dig into your issue so you know it inside and out, and then work over time in a, a consistent structured way, meeting individual legislators um, on both sides of the aisle and develop that relationship on that issue, understanding that you know sometimes issues do just come and go really fast and sometimes issues take years and years to, to convince uh, people and it's it's a little hard after elections too because you may have uh, 10 people may change out during election and nine of those might have been on your side and now you have 10 new people to go back and try and start over and and rebuild that issue and, and with the house it's much you know twice as frequent as with the senate uh that that members come and go and it, gosh it feels like maybe 15 16 new members this time in the house i guess i have to check but uh just a lot what Senator Austin, do you have anything to add to that about? Yeah, the... let, let me also just bounce back because it's it's really close to my heart about, I, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of people feeling good about coming to testify. Whether whether you're a, a truck driver or you got a PhD, because what we really want is the boots on the ground. That's what I look at. I would much rather hear from somebody that I call the boots on the ground that lives in that particular world than what I call the suit people, the lobbyists, the suit people. So, uh, you know, don't ever be intimidated or hesitant to come and, and testify. When I hear a bill on the Senate floor and it's regard to law enforcement, I call the boots on the ground in Lafayette, Indiana, my three police chiefs. If it's medical, I call my two hospital experts uh, back in Lafayette and get their opinions. There's the best information you can get is the people that it works in that area, the boots on the ground, the ordinary people that, that knows it from A to Z. Now to answer your last question, this is, this is the key word, which is true in anything in life. It's called persistence. Persistence, persistence, persistence. I've seen bills that I thought to myself, wow, they're going to struggle getting this through and it's sailed through. And I've seen easy bills that's taken quite a, quite a long time. My friend Tammy Lowe remembers, and so do you, Lisa, when Senator Weiss was there, it took what, 14 years to get 0.08 through? Yeah. I mean, I served in those days where 0.08 wasn't in and, and, and it finally came through. Yeah. So, but they never gave up. It's persistence, persistence, persistence. Yeah, I remember that too. That did take quite a while. And just, and I always tell people just because it makes logical sense to you or it's backed with data, it doesn't mean that every legislator is going to see it that way either. So it is part, it's a lot of persistence and a lot of just convincing people. And, and honestly, sometimes you have to cut your losses too. I know there are certain legislators that no matter what data I give them, they're never gonna change their mind. So I don't focus all my time and energy on them. I move on to other people that I know, you know, may not be as, um, you know, set in their decision. So, um, so that's a lesson I've learned too. Don't waste your time on people who really don't, will never support you. I'm not saying you shouldn't try, but just don't put all your energy there. Um, well, we are wrapping up our questions and I just wanna open it up uh, to our viewers if you have any last questions. Otherwise, I would like uh, each of you to kind of give, a, give us a closing word of wisdom or a statement about um, you know, the next session or about connecting with their legislator or whatever you wanna talk about. Um, and I don't see any other questions. So uh, Senator Alting, would you like to uh, give us some closing words of wisdom? Well, I'm not sure if I've got a lot of wisdom to give you, uh, but let me just simply say uh, everything that we've said, and you, by the way, Tammy, you did a fantastic job uh, 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 
Tammy. I'm thinking of Tammy Lowe. See, yeah, she's she, on my mind. Yeah. My Thank buddy you. Tammy. I know she's listening. Is why I know her like a book. Yeah, I'm probably glued to this. Uh, but thank you, Lisa, for what you have done. Uh, the questions were outstanding, and I think what what you should get a sense of. It's a great honor to serve with Representative Smaltz, and as you can see, we're we're very much alike, uh, more alike in in different ways than we are uh, not alike, and it really makes it wonderful uh, to work with a gentleman that uh, you're passing such important legislation dealing with uh, a controlled substances alcohol. But I, I, I just want to say this last election, if it showed one thing, people got involved, people got mm -hmm. involved. And that's what I suggest for you to continue to do. You know, I was the author of the vote centers that are out there. And I was sharing the other night with a constituent, what would we have done without vote centers in this past election? We all remember the old days that you went and voted in your precinct. And if you wasn't in that precinct, they'd say you have to go drive across town and go to another one by people. Wasn't any great idea that I had. It was, it was driven by ordinary, simple people that had an idea and a thought, and we implemented it. So get involved, be a part of the process. And, and be continue to be a giver because it's addicting. That's why I've been here so long. It's, a, it's addicting. It's a wonderful feeling to help others. So thank you again. It's my pleasure to have been on. Well, we thank you, Senator Alting, for all your years of service. Um, I do enjoy coming to your committee and um, we have worked together on several issues over the years. So um, I hope to continue to be able to do that. So thank you for your time today. Uh, Representative Smaltz, what would you like to close us with? I'd just like to say thanks for, for having me on. Uh, I appreciate the passion that, that goes into the issues that, that you care about. I, I appreciate you being there and uh, being the collective voice of uh, folks who are concerned about alcohol and uh, how it's regulated in the state of Indiana. I'm looking forward to working with Ron this year um, in particular, we've, we've developed a really good relationship and we're about to see some obvious adversity with how the structure of session is going to be and, and having relationships in place um, just takes one thing off of our list that we have to accomplish in order to get out of session and have, uh, uh, have really done the right thing. So I appreciate being here and, and everything that you do. Well, and I have to say, uh, I enjoy working with Representative Smoltz as well. Um, we have some very spirited discussions about things, but um, I find him always to be um, open to the information that I share with him. In fact, I appreciate it when he contacts me and Senator Alting does as well to ask about, you know, what are my views on a particular issue? Do I have any data that I can share? And you know I do, because data's my thing. Um, so I appreciate working with um, Representative Smaltz and Senator Alting and, um, you know, I feel like um, you should definitely get to know them if you don't know them because they're both uh, great legislators and great human beings, more importantly, um, not just great legislators. So thank you, gentlemen, and um, look forward to seeing you during session one way or thank another. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Be safe. Bye. Well, thank you, everyone, for um, your questions during that session, um, I really uh, appreciated the discussion. I think they're both great uh, legislators. I enjoy working with them both. So um, I uh, really appreciated their input. So um, anyway, we are going to, uh, we have a couple of minutes before we move on to the next um session which is going to be with Rosie King and please uh please take the survey um that Eric posted the link so we can make sure to send that to our uh legislators or our funders not our legislators and Eric is right I did mention at the beginning that I did invite a uh, representative Terry Austin who is a Democrat I also invited I represented Justin Moed and neither of them were able to attend. So I wasn't excluding anyone, uh, gender or 
party. It just so happened that they weren't able to attend. So please take the survey if you haven't. Um, we will take just a couple of minutes while we get Rosie set up. So uh, be back in about five minutes. Rosie, do you um, have slides that you are going to share? Yes. Okay. I will make you a... Um... I do see the share screen option. Okay. You, sh you probably, you, be, you might be able to. Why don't you try and make sure you can. I think I set it up so that you could. I just want to make sure. Ah, perfect. Are you seeing it? Okay. Yep. Perfect. We have a couple more people uh, coming in, so... We'll give yeah. it a couple more minutes. Because yep, I know I, in the agenda, it said there was going to be a break till 2.30. So yeah. I don't. Yeah, we're on a break. Perfect. Now, I guess you don't need to see me. Huh, well, we would like to see you if you would like to show yourself. I don't know. I can't find, now that I'm sharing my screen, I can't see how to turn my, uh, That's all the PowerPoint. Um, I'm gonna, see. oh, here we go. There it is. Ta-da! Yay! There I am. <clears throat> okay. Oh, Eric looks like he's in the uh, Circle Center Mall. <laughs> hey, nice office, Eric. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Rosie, you have a new haircut. <laughs> I have a lack of a haircut. <laughs> I was going to say, I like it. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, my last haircut was about March 10th. So uh, I know, you know, our, our survey has changed a little bit. I want to give those of you who don't know about our survey a little bit of history. Um, but I think this is our 10th one that we did, just the last one, Rosie. 10th or 11th, I can't remember. Yeah. So uh, 11th. So when I first started this job, um, just as the director, we're waiting to hear back the results. Terry has not felt well at all, which is very worried. Um, when, uh, when I first started this job, uh, the Indiana Coalition Reduced Underage Drinking in the state was doing nothing with college campuses, nothing. So as Tammy, can attest, I, you know, figured if no one else is doing it, I'm going to do it. So I begged for some money and we started the Indiana uh, Collegiate Action Network. And then I thought, okay, we need some data because you heard me talk about that in the last segment with the legislators. That's very important to me and I'm a data person. So um, I asked for money from the state to start a survey. And it was basically just Here's how much money we have, which at the time I think was $5,000, wasn't very much money. And um, I said to IPRC, what can we do with this money? And so we've been working with them since then. And our survey has changed a lot since then. And what I love about our survey is that we can tailor it to Indiana, um, which you can't do with some of the national surveys. So I really appreciate that about ours. And um, so I've been working with Rosie for a long time. I love working with Rosie and her team. They're very easy to work with. Um, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and talk about what she does at Prevention Insights. And then um, I'm sure at some point in your presentation, you talk about the changes to the survey, how it's every other year, blah, blah, blah. But um, she'll talk to you about how to get involved when the next one is. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll highlight some of the data from our last survey that we've done, which was in 2019. Um, so take it away, Rosie. Okay, so I see here, I actually have the wrong date on this slide. It's November 12th today. And I am with Prevention Insights at Indiana University Bloomington, and we used to be called Prevention Resource Center. So like Lisa said, the survey was developed 
with us and ICANN in 2009, and we look at substance use, risk factors, mental health, and gambling behaviors. The survey is funded by the Division of Mental Health and Addiction, and beginning in 2019, it has moved to be offered only in the odd-numbered years. And all um, higher education schools in Indiana are invited two-year and four-year private and public. And it is an online survey and the school, the participating school emails the student themselves, who, whichever students they want to invite, the school sends out the email. So this shows the number of schools that have participated over time. And you can see that there is a lot of variation. And so this is, um, because it's just, it's not a random sample, it's offered to everyone and whoever wants to participate does. So our results from year to year can be influenced by this um, sampling limitation, especially like in 2015, we had just uh, six or seven schools. And so um, that makes the results, it's, it, to, we need to keep in mind that when we look at the results. And this is the number of students who participated every year. And again, you can see that it varies quite a bit, everything from like less than 2,000 to almost 10,000. So again, year to year comparisons um, will be affected by which schools participated and how many students participated. And this just shows the geographic distribution throughout the 11 years. We've had 60 schools take the survey at least once. So pretty much across the state. And I will just quickly review that this is the um, presentation that I gave last year at this time with the 2019 data. But for anyone who wasn't there, just to kind of see how obviously alcohol is the most common substance used. And there's a big difference by age in alcohol use. Underage students was about 50%, whereas the 21 to 25 year olds, almost 80% had used alcohol in the past month. When marijuana and vaping were the next most common substances, and there was practically no difference by age in marijuana use among, unless you were over 25, and then it definitely dropped. But with the vaping, it definitely was more likely to be reported by younger students than by the older students. And then this just shows that the other substances on the survey, very few students reported using these are like 2% or less who reported using these substances. So really alcohol, vaping, marijuana, and cigarettes are the most common substances. And when we look at the results by gender, um, you can see the alcohol, there's hardly any difference in alcohol or marijuana use, but the males were more likely to report vaping and cigarette use. And with binge drinking, a little, very little difference by gender. By age, again, the 21 to 25 year olds reported the highest percent. So when we look at whether someone is a member of a social fraternity or sorority, they are much more likely to report using alcohol, binge drinking, or using marijuana in the past month. And this, we kind of, we knew it and the data definitely um, documents that. And then when we ask about where they live, again, living in the fraternity or sorority, uh, stu those students were much more likely to, much, much more likely to report, um, especially binge drinking. So looking at the, the national data from Monitoring the Future that has been collecting data on college students since 1980, uh, the rates between 1980 and 1995 were up around 75, 80%. And then from 1995 to 2009, they were between 65 and 70%. And then since 2009, which is when our survey began, there's been this kind of slow 
uh, decrease in the rates. And in fact, in 2018, the percentage of students who said they had used alcohol in the past month was the lowest rate ever recorded by that survey. But then in 2019, we're seeing a little uptick. So it will remain to be seen if that is a, a new trend in the upward direction or, uh, or not. And when we look at our uh, Indiana data in blue, you can see even though we have concern about from year to year, we're sampling different students, we still, besides like 2009, 2011, and 2018, um, our rates were very similar to the, the national rates and are also showing that sort of general uh, lowering over time. With binge drinking also, the rates since 1980 did not change much until the mid 90s started to come down a little bit. And then really since 2014, we've seen pretty significant drop in the rates. And 2018 was the lowest ever recorded, but now again with binge drinking, seeing an increase in 2019. And our rates are, always uh, higher than the national rates. Um, even though the past month alcohol use, we were pretty close except for a few years with binge drinking, we're showing higher rates, I think in every year except maybe 2010. Um, and whether that actually reflects the Indiana students in general being more likely to binge drink, uh, we're, we're not sure. Past month vaping, uh, we added in uh, 2016, and this is the national data. And you in 20, between 2017 and 2018, the increase in, stu in students who said they had vaped in the past month was, was the, the highest increase that the Monitoring the Future survey had ever recorded for any substance in all of its whatever 40 years or whatever it was. Um, so this was, this came out on the scene, you know, with gangbusters, you know, once the jewel marketing campaign kind of got underway in 2016, 2017, and you can see that between 2018 and 19, that that continued to go up. And our data is almost I'm very close to the data that uh, was seen nationally. And I will say in our youth survey, which, uh, surveys high school students and middle school students. In 2020, we saw that rate coming down. And so hopefully we will see that in our college survey in 2021, because there has been uh, quite a bit of legislation against Juul, uh, re requiring them to stop marketing to youth and also the all of the health consequences that have come to light with vaping have uh, hopefully made an impact on uh, students' choice to vape, but we will see in 2021. The past month marijuana use is a different story. Um, it, this is the national use and it has been rising since um, 2006. And this rate in 2019 is the highest rate that they have found on the Monitoring the Future survey since 1982, which was almost like the peak of the um, drug epidemic uh, back then in the late 70s, early 80s. So we haven't seen that rate since 1982. And our um, Indiana data has more fluctuation than the national data. Um, but still our rates sort of over time look like they are going up, especially 2016 and, and beyond, they've been higher. The survey also asked um, students where they are uh, most likely to drink. And you can see how with the orange back, uh, chart with the uh, 21 to 25 year olds drinking in bars and restaurants and off campus houses is very common with the underage students, the off campus houses is the most common and fraternities and sororities and residence halls and on campus all kind of close in in percents.
uh, when we look at the type of alcohol consumed um, by age, liquor is more favored by younger people um, and kind of beer and wine by the, the older students. Um, when we look at it by gender, um, the males and females, almost the same rate for uh, preferred liquor, but males are much more likely to say beer and females are much more likely to say wine or malt beverages. And when you look at reasons for drinking for all three age categories, having a good time with friends is the number one response and relaxing is the number two response. And then in terms of consequences by gender, having a hangover, blacking out, feeling guilty, and doing something you later regretted, those are all um, over 20% of the students who uh, drank alcohol in the past year um, reported those consequences. And then we ask about consequences of other students drinking. And it's like half of the students, male and female, said they had to take care of somebody else because they drank too much. And about a third had their study or sleep interrupted because of someone else's drinking. So looking at sources of alcohol among underage students, the, the number one way they get their alcohol is by friends over 21 providing it, um, off campus and on campus parties. Um, the bottom chart is, or graph bar is purchased from a retailer and that's 10%. So um, it is the least likely way that underage students are reporting that they get their alcohol. But out of that 10% who said they bought it from a realtor or a retailer, um, you can see that almost like two thirds said they were able to buy it without using an ID. Uh, less than half said they used a fake ID and less than a third said they used someone else's ID. So buying it without ID was the most common way that the students who did buy from a retailer got it. And so this just shows that over time, again, um, the, we had an Indiana mandatory carding law enacted in 2010, which said everybody needs to show ID. And the percentage of students in 2010 who said they had bought from a retailer was about 10%. Then after that law went into effect in 2011, that rate had dropped down to about seven or 8%. Uh, in 2011, that law was modified so that now you get carded if you supposedly, if you uh, look like you're less than 45 years, I think it is. Uh, since that modification, we saw an immediate uh, rebound in the percentage of students who said they buy from a retailer back up to around the 10%. And then beginning in 2016, it actually has gone up a little bit like 11, 12%. So then out of those students who said they bought from a retailer, the percent who said that they were able to do it without, without any ID, um, without being asked for ID, again, you can see how that really dropped in 2011 and then has just continued to go back up. So, um, the fear of being carded has, uh, it looks like, you know, has, has lessened with the change in that law. And then we ask about if students, underage students think that they might get uh, ticketed, get in trouble for being caught uh, drinking. And very few, less than half felt, you know, they would uh, like very likely or somewhat likely uh, that an underage student would be ticketed. 
Um, and especially off campus housing, there's very little um, perception of risk of being ticketed around a quarter, 25% of the students only thought that they might get ticketed if they consumed alcohol off campus. Okay, and so then uh, we also asked about how many, when you drink, how many drinks do you typically use, consume? And then also a question, how many drinks do you think the average student consumes when they drink? And so you can see here um, that the blue line is how, how many drinks were reported and the orange bar is how many drinks they think the average student drinks. And you can see how it's skewed to where many more people are reporting um, fewer drinks than the than those who perceive students drinking having more drinks the average student having more drinks the most common category was four to five drinks they think the average student drinks four or five drinks and this just kind of shows that 68 percent of the students reported that they typically drink three or fewer drinks but 61% of the students thought that the average student drank more than three drinks. And this is asking about what percent of students, not how many drinks the average student takes, but what percentage of students drink alcohol in the past month. And you can see that this is uh, almost 40%, 37% of the students overestimated the um, number of students who drink. So, you know, 37% of the students thought that 70% or more of the students at their school drank alcohol, when in fact, the actual number was 61%. And this is just about what they think their peers uh, approve of. And uh, you can see that the, the males do not consider, 34% um, of the males thought that their uh, peers would disapprove if they had five or more drinks in one sitting. 43% um, of the males thought that peers would disapprove of them using marijuana. Um, the, the prescription medication is, is a different story and most of the students feel like their peers would disapprove of them uh, misusing prescription drugs. But in terms of marijuana and binge drinking, the female students are still uh, less than half thought that their peers would disapprove of them binge drinking or using marijuana. So we also ask about uh, some mental health indicators and we have got um, a question about, have you felt so sad or hopeless every day for two or more weeks in a row that you stopped doing some normal things? And you can see by gender, um, a, over a fifth of the male students and about a third of the female students said that they had experienced that kind of that's kind of a an indicator of depression and um in the past year and then when asked about uh, if they had seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year we've got 10 percent of the male students who took this survey and a little more of the female students said that they had seriously considered attempting suicide and those questions were added in 2016 and so just looking over time you know, we, did, we have seen a, an increase in the, both of those rates over time. And we know nationally they're seeing um, that becoming uh, more of a concern. So here I looked at the, um, based on a person's substance use. And so with the male students, um, if they did not use, so the blue is no alcohol use and the orange is alcohol use. And this is whether they uh, report, if they reported feeling sad or hopeless for two or more weeks in a row. And you can see when the males 
depending on whether they used alcohol in the past month or not, there's not really any difference in whether they reported experiencing that sadness. But with the females, there is a significant number who more who reported um, feeling sad if they had reported drinking alcohol in the past month. Now with marijuana use, both male and females were much more uh, likely to report having experienced depression if they used marijuana in the past month than if they did not. So the gold is if they did not use marijuana and you can see the rates of those people who uh, experienced depression. And then the green is if they had used marijuana in the past month and um, very highly significant for both genders. I need your consent on a few items to continue. And then I also looked at it in terms of the seriously consider, considering suicide question. And again, for um, alcohol, there was no significant difference in how if a male student had used alcohol or not, and if they had um, reported thinking seriously about suicide in the past year. Whereas with the females, there is a slightly higher percentage of female students who used alcohol, and it is significant, um, who said that they had considered suicide. But again, when we look at marijuana, it is a dramatically higher number of percentage of students who used marijuana, who reported considering suicide in the past year compared to those who did not use marijuana. So new changes in our 2021 survey, we have a new response option for the question on where a student lives. Um, and they now have the option to say not living near campus, taking all classes remotely and not physically interacting with the campus community. And this can be useful if you want to kind of isolate out different behaviors based on whether the student is actually interacting with your campus or whether they are completely remote this year. And obviously that's due to COVID. <laughs> there are new gender response options and they now can mark all that apply. And there are many options, including a text box for them to self-describe. Uh, these are, this wording came from DMHA. This is now how they want the uh, gender questions asked. So we matched their, their request. And there's also a sexual change in the sexual orientation question. Again, this is the wording preferred by DMHA to um, do you identify as member of the LGBTQ plus community? And then those who respond yes have can mark all that apply in their sexual orientation, again, including a text box to self-describe. So this is our website. It's at uh, iprc.iu.edu. And on it, you can find out information about our survey and also about administering the survey. And there are some tips for increasing response rate. Um, you can view the survey questionnaire. Um, we have a section for additional questions. If you want to add questions to your survey, uh, you can add up to 10. And if you are trying to find some, we, we have compiled questions from national surveys so that uh, on different things like nutrition, uh, I think violence, um, safety. And so if, you're, if you wanna look for some wording that um, has possibly had some validity and reliability testing, you can find that there. You'll see a sample of what your school report is going to look like. And then also down at the bottom and it got cut off, but all of our statewide uh, reports are there if you wanna look at the statewide stuff. So the registration is now open for 2021. Um, and like I said, the survey is free to you and you can add up to 10 questions. You will get a report of your own findings. And again, there is the, um, 
the URL for the website and you can email me at um, ICSUS at indiana.edu. Woohoo, we have our own email address. That's fancy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I would encourage you, especially um, the new schools that are on, I would really encourage you to um, email Rosie and get signed up. Um, it's an easy process. She and her team work with you to make sure everything is uh, in place and ready to go. And, um, you know, the fact that it's free, first of all, which I think is amazing because it's really good data and it's really good methodology. They know what they're doing. But also the fact that you can ask 10 of your own questions is amazing because then you can, uh, you know, ask questions about whatever you want. It doesn't even have, have to be substance abuse related. It could be anything. So I think it's a wealth of data that we all need as we plan our programming and um, can't emphasize enough that it's free. I don't know. I know some of you paid to take the other surveys and I know how much they cost. And this one, um, the beauty of it is that we can tailor it to Indiana as our, our laws and policies change about alcohol and other substances. We can tailor it um, as we see things happening in our state. We can, you know, tailor our questions. So um, I think everyone should be taking it. And the fact that it's every other year now, I think will lessen some of that survey fatigue that students have. Um, so definitely contact Rosie and um, I would love to see 100% of ICANN members um, participate in it. And um, you know, that only makes our data better. So thank you, Rosie. Does anyone have any questions for Rosie? Feel free to unmute yourselves to ask or Type it in the chat box. And I will say, Lisa, we've got 20 schools signed up already this year. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Great. Wonderful. That is great. That's great. Um, <clears throat> I do want to comment that um, Lisa said something at the beginning of when she wanted to start the, the survey and how she was going to go to the state and ask for money. <laughs> Actually, she said, we're going to do a survey and we're going to find money to do it. And we all said, okay, great, Lisa, good luck, because we did not think this was going to happen. <clears throat> and lo and behold, she found the money for it. So <laughs> continues to find the money for it. So that's quite impressive. <laughs> well, thank you, Tammy. That's true. I, I have a little stubborn streak in me and, you know, sometimes I just have to figure it out. But I will say Division of Mental Health and Addiction has been very supportive of our efforts over the years. And um, they are the ones who fund the survey and who gave us money to get ICANN started. It was a small amount at the beginning and has grown over the years. So I really appreciate the support of DMHA. Um, and frankly, you know, you all doing the things you do on campus is good for DMHA because they have to collect data and you all are doing evidence-based, you know, programming with their target population. So I think it's a definitely a symbiotic relationship that we have with them. Um, and I've enjoyed working with Rosie over the years. I can't believe we're, you know, have done our 11th survey already, um, but it's great. I hope you participate. I look forward to seeing the data. It's always like exciting when Rosie will, you know, say we're almost done with the data and she'll send it to me so I can have kind of a first look at it. It's very, I love getting it um, because I always tell people you cannot, how can you address an issue if you don't know if it's an issue? Like you have to have data. So anyway. Uh, I will say Lisa that um, Julia from DePaul was the one who was asking about the, um, as she was commenting that we're seeing the uh, marijuana rates go up and we're seeing the mental health um, indicators going up. And so she uh, asked about that um, analysis of looking at whether that was linked. And so, um, you know, I was surprised to see how strikingly it is linked. Yeah. Um, and so if anyone has other thoughts or, or an interest in exploring the data in another way, I love to get your ideas um, to see what we can find out in the data. Definitely. And I think this, you know, the survey we do next year is going to be 
quite interesting and maybe an anomaly because of COVID, I guess we'll have to see. But um, I think we know that alcohol use has gone up among adults. So no doubt it's probably gone up among college students as well, but maybe not, maybe it hasn't because there are not as many opportunities for communal drinking as there used to be. But anyway, any other questions for Rosie before we- I have a comment, on? just yeah. an idea of, um as one of the 10 custom questions, schools should consider having one of the questions be like, which academic school are you enrolled in? Because boy, does that really get the deans fired up when you have a rank sheet of <laughs> the schools that <laughs> have some of the biggest issues. So that uh, that really helped to get um, our dean's attention. We plan on doing something like that on all future surveys. So. Oh, that's a good idea, Eric. Yeah. Good idea. All right, anybody else have any questions or comments for Rosie? Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rosie. I wish it weren't in person, but maybe next year. <laughs> next year, definitely by next year. Let's hope. Yes, thanks to Travis and anyone else who's in the uh, the uh, trial for the vaccine. We hope we have that soon, widespread available. So thank you, Rosie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, if everyone could turn on your cameras as we wrap up, I would like for us to be able to see our faces before we go. Um, at least one view of our faces before we go. Um, I know it is tough to hang in for an all day conference and I hope that you have come away with something useful today. I think the discussion was great. Um, you know, I, as much as we're all sick of doing Zoom, I think um, there were a lot of things out of today that maybe we can improve on. Like I like the way we reported out the mini grants for instance, instance, I think it's a great way to have a more intense discussion about those. So, um, so share your thoughts with us in the chat box or send Eric or I an email and let us know what you thought of today. We're not asking evaluation questions about that because um, that is, you know, we're asking about the content instead, but I would like to hear your thoughts. Um, Hopefully we will never have to do an all virtual conference again, but you never know. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. If you signed up for day two, make sure you have the link for day two. Um, and if you don't, please email and we will send that back out to you. Um, that is all Title IX, like I said, all Peter Lake. Um, so that'll be a little different format tomorrow, but um, really good information. So please make sure you attend that. If you haven't signed up, we can get you signed up. Um, we have uh, just awarded our mini grants and then we had money left for planning grants. So uh, we will be posting that on our website as soon as all of those MRUs are signed. But uh, congratulations to several of you on the call. You have either a mini grant or a planning grant. So we hope you can use that funding well. Um, and then look for our training calendar com to come out. Our next training uh, is going to be, I think in February, uh, it'll be about data and how to use it. And it'll be perfect for those of you who've never participated in the survey before and you wanna know how to, like Eric was saying, how do we get people on our campus to pay attention to this data? Um, so we'll be talking about um, data. So uh, please be on that uh, training. You'll get more information about that as well. Uh, Eric Kilbride, do you have anything else to add? Or Harry? Okay. Um, well, I really appreciate you being on. Thank you for uh, responding to the polls. Those will be really useful as we give those to our uh, funders. And um, I hope it wasn't too excruciating today. I love seeing all you guys. Oh, I miss all of your faces. Um, and have a great rest of your week. It's almost Friday. Not that that means anything anymore, but it is almost Friday. Um, please feel free to email Eric or me or Harry if you have any questions about, oh yeah, first of all, Jenna, before we go, you need to introduce us to this little bundle of joy. She she just woke up. She was sleeping Yay. on my lap. So she's got some really nice bed head going on. But uh, um, this is Miss Clara. She was born at the end of July and is just about three and a half months old. So I just got back from maternity leave. Uh, and so it's good to see everyone again. Uh, so yeah. She's cute and she has a lot of hair. 
She has so much hair. Yeah, she was born with uh, a lot of hair in it, and she hasn't lost any of it. As you can see, it's like this really lovely, messy look that she's got going on. But so cute. Congratulations, and thanks. welcome back. Thanks. Thanks. Does anyone else have any uh, announcements you want to make or something good to share with the rest of us before we go? I'll just mention that this is probably my last conference <clears throat> um, because I am retiring on January 1st. So I want to tell you that I have loved working with all of you. It's been fantastic and uh, I wish you all the best. And we will miss Tammy. I've been working with Tammy for years and years and I will miss seeing her on our regular conferences and trainings, but I know where you live, so I'll come find it. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to share before we go? Um, just really quick, I'm gonna be starting December 1st at Vincennes University in their counseling center. So oh. I, I still plan on being around and being involved just in a different school, so. Okay. wow, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay, a lot of changes. Anybody else? Well, good luck with the rest of whatever is gonna happen. I know I've been getting texts while I've been on this call about our school system. I heard that Marion County just announced they're going to be all virtual and I believe our school system is headed that way at least our high school so these are crazy times stay safe um thank you Travis for being a guinea pig for us with the with the vaccine and hopefully we can all get that soon and get back to normal oh, you got it I'm happy to do it <laughs> so we can see each other in person next time so thanks everybody have a great rest of your week bye you're out